people in. Um, we're already up to 1.30 here. Don't come in right on the moment. So thank you all for joining tonight's program. It should be an excellent program. We're already at 133 people. Our record is 150. I see no reason why we won't uh, meet and uh, beat that. But welcome to our first meeting of the new year. Uh, if I can ask you all, those of you who have your video on, please turn your video off just to make sure Jack has a maximum bandwidth. Uh, if you do not turn it off, I will be turning off your video for you. So please, uh, uh, please do that in the meantime. Uh, let me explain. Uh, well, first of all, our next show will be Friday, February 19th. Our presenter will be Eric Zostowitz. Um, just so you know how things work, if you have a question, please put it in the chat. Um, Please keep your questions to either location, uh, pretty much location and time. Uh, if you have detailed technical questions about equipment, you can put them in, but I'm not going to pass those on to Jack uh, at his request. Um, um, but there are a lot of experts in the group tonight. Feel free to answer each other's questions as they come up. I will look for an opportunity as uh, Jack takes a break to um, ask questions. Um, let me see, anything else? Uh, I'm very pleased with, I'm very pleased with tonight's uh, turnout as we've had in the last few months. Um, we do not have a paywall. And while this is cheaper than doing this at a hotel, we do have expenses with recording the program, it's being recorded tonight and also allowing uh, more than 40 minutes for a program. If you're enjoying the programs and you are not yet a member, please consider becoming a member. Uh, the website is erausa.org. It's www.erausa.org. You can either join as a member or we are happy uh, to take donations. ERA is a 501c3 tax exempt corporation. So your donations are, uh, are tax deductible. Again, on that website, you can either join as a member, make a donation or do both. Uh, our meetings will continue to be on Zoom until further notice. Uh, when it looks like uh, we will be able to be back at a hotel, we will look for space, uh, but we will be doing everything possible to keep the Zoom meetings moving, whether we are in a hotel uh, or not. <clears throat> okay, so uh, with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Jack May. I don't think he needs an introduction. He usually starts each New Year's program for the, the ERA. His involvement with ERA uh, goes back to the 1960s, including a seven-year stint as the editor of Headlights. Many know him, including myself, as the organizer and leader of ERA. I'll let my Headlights magazine, if you really ask. I won't answer. Okay. Uh, please mute your, okay, I'm going to mute yourself, mute all of you again. Jack, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Okay. All right. Um, so Jack has led both uh, North American international conventions for some 30 years. Um, Jack still uses film and the program will consist of digital scans of slides that he exposed while crisscrossing the USA in the past 10 years. There are also some surprises. Uh, the title of his presentation, I'll let him describe it. It's called Modern Streetcar Systems in the USA, 
a personal survey with digressions, detours, and diversions, and they are very worthwhile, uh, worthwhile diversions. Uh, Jack, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, uh, the show is yours. I'm going to let you present your show, and uh, please okay. take it away, Jack. Not everybody has turned their videos off. I'm going to, you can go ahead. I will go okay. ahead and turn the videos off, but you can start. Oh, Go ahead, Chad. Uh, share your screen. Okay, I got to hit share screen. Right. And then I've got to uh, go to my main area, which is here. Right. And put on the title slide. Right. And then hit the play button. And there we'll go. Okay. Okay. We don't see it yet. Oh, okay. I see it, but do I have to do something else? Andrew? You have to select the screen when, the, when you hit the share, you have to click on which one of the screens you're going to be sharing and then hit the share button. So I have to go back. Right to where the share button is? Yep. Pick the pick the part of the screen you're going to share and then hit the share button on the lower right. Okay. There you go. Yep. And okay, do you see it now? Yep. yep. And now you just do your Picasso to full screen. Right. There you go. Perfect. Okay. The main portion of tonight's program, as Bob said, will be a survey of what the industry calls modern streetcar lines. Almost all the views are digitally scanned from 35 millimeter slides, which I took in the last few years on various trips by air, rail, and automobile. I'm going to read a probably overly long introduction which I hope will not bore you before getting into the slides. Please bear with me. Americans have a tendency to categorize, to create named buckets and then assign individual items into them to emphasize differences. An example of this is what has been done in our avocation of steel wheel on steel rail transit systems, which have been classified in broad terms as heavy rail, metro subway, light rail and streetcars or trolleys. But that is nothing new as when I joined the ERA in 1958 after finding out I wasn't the only one in the world interested in streetcars and subways and knowing virtually nothing about rail operations outside of New York City and Philadelphia, I began reading current and back issues of Headlights, which at the time was a monthly news magazine, much like the bulletin is today. I discovered the terms rapid transit, trolleys, streetcars, and interurban. Like today, these classifications were really a continuum with the lines between them very hard to define, blurry. What was the Philadelphia and Western with its sleek bullet cars? This photo shows a 1931 real built bullet in septa colors at the Rock Hill Trolley Museum in Orbisonia, Pennsylvania. Was it rapid transit? Because the line is totally grade separated and has high platforms at a station? Or an interurban? Because when it operates equipment in multiple units, passengers can't walk from one car to another, and thus a fare collector had to be stationed in each unit. This slide shows the Norristown High Speed Line newest cars built by ESEA in Sweden, which came in 1993. I remember arguments galore about this among our stalwart members in the late 1950s and early 60s. And today, who could avoid discussing the same questions? Doesn't the Portland streetcar have a great many similarities to Max, Portland's light rail transit? The fact is that both employ virtually the same technology using basics that date back 
to Frank Sprague's successful introduction of a trolley system in 1888. But our transit agencies, consultants, journalists, and car builders still separate light rail from streetcar, probably based on various characteristics like the length of lines, passenger carrying capability, speed of operation, and location of right of way. Thus, we have LRT <coughs> in cities like Dallas, Denver, and St. Louis, whose rights of ways are substantially not in street pavement and tend to extend into suburban areas, and streetcars, which for the most part run on streets. Interestingly, the first of our country's new light rail systems is called the San Diego Trolley. For the most part, the new LRT systems were built principally to improve mobility and reduce congestion, while those systems now classified as streetcars were only built partly for that purpose as they were also created specifically to improve certain areas of their respective cities by promoting investment in the development of new office and residential business buildings and for the renewal, restoration and redevelopment of areas that had fallen into disrepair. Basically an invention in an investment in infrastructure. The new streetcar system seemed to have come about because city fathers saw how earlier light rail systems like the San Diego trolley improved their cities and wanted to create the same results in their own backyards, but could only afford, afford a smaller investment and therefore built shorter lines using existing streets. The permanence of having fixed visible tracks serving traffic generators like museums, hospitals, stadiums, other entertainment venues and office buildings would attract investments in the city in contrast with the operation of buses that could be easily discontinued or rerouted. In 2009, the federal government through the US Department of that Transportation created the TIGER program, transportation investment generating economic recovery, which funded many of the new streetcar systems. That program is now called BUILD, better utilizing investments to leverage development. Thus the return or the rebirth of the streetcars some year after the creation of light rail. Meanwhile, during this period, the so-called legacy streetcar or trolley systems in cities like Boston, Philadelphia, San Francisco and New Orleans soldiered on while newer operations took on these exciting new names and concepts. These, these new streetcar systems seem to come in two formats, modern streetcars, like in Cincinnati, Detroit, Seattle, and so on, which we will explore soon, and not so modern ones, such as those in Tampa, Memphis, and Little Rock that have tried to evoke a feeling of nostalgia by using actual real traditional trolleys or new ones built to look like them. But I raise the question, what really is modern? I think modernity has a, a relationship to time and place. And perhaps modernism is in the eye of the beholder. Are the legacy operations in Boston, Philadelphia, and San Francisco modern light rail, modern streetcar, or not modern at all. I grew up living with my parents in an apartment at 165th Street and Walton Avenue in the Bronx. It was just a few blocks from 167th Street. And as early as my memory exists, I knew I was in love with the Third Avenue Railway System streetcars running cross town along that thoroughfare. Even as a seven or eight year old child, I realized that the cars on my line look old fashioned as they were clearly not as up to date as the ones on Tremont Avenue and Southern Boulevard, which looked much newer and moved faster. But once I had a better understanding, I knew that these real convertible cars built in 1911 were once the epitome of modernity. What could be better 
than riding in hot weather in vehicles whose sides had been removed so passengers caught the breeze. The newer modern cars were stuffy in those days before air conditioning was common. Both, of course, were equally warm in the winter. Anyway, I was really distraught in 1948 when at the age of 11, my streetcars disappeared, replaced by stinky buses. For some reason, I thought that all the streetcars in the world were gone, probably because I had never set foot out of New York. So be it, I was resigned. Six years later in 1954, I graduated from high school and was admitted to the University of Pennsylvania. And in the summer, my parents took me down to Philadelphia to see the campus. My mother wanted to stop and shop at Wanamaker's, so they found a parking space on 12th Street between Market and Chestnut, and I stayed in the car in case a cop came by. What did I see? Something incredible. Old fashioned trolley cars running on Market Street and modern looking ones on Chestnut and on 12th. Streetcars had not been wiped off the face of the earth after all. This is an example of what I saw running on Route 20 in Philadelphia. And to my eyes, it was as modern as any transit vehicle could be. Wow. And for the next four years of my life, these and other trolleys were what I was fortunate enough to see and ride. Ironically, these PCC cars were being built in St. Louis at the exact same time that their cousins in the Bronx were on their way to oblivion. Now, enough of my ramblings and we'll move on to the slides with the first few showing what I consider modern streetcars in Philadelphia. This is a view of PTC PCC 2733 built in 1947 on display in the basement of SEPTA headquarters at 1234 Market Street in Philadelphia. For the time it was modern, although it did not have air conditioning or method to allow disabled people to ride. Well, these cars are still in service, although they are totally rebuilt and they were rebuilt in 2003 by Brookville in Pennsylvania and are now called modern PCC2 cars. And they run on Route 15. Note the roof line that has changed drastically. And it basically was added for air conditioning and lifts. Here's a view of one of the cars running in West Philadelphia on Girard Avenue in springtime a couple of years ago. Another view of a fan trip with one of the PCC2s alongside a Kawasaki at the Island Road and Elmwood Avenue terminal of Route 36. 112 single-ended and 29 double-ended Kawasaki cars were built to replace the PCCs. And that was done in 1981 and 1982. Here on the Penn campus at 40th and Market, the School of Dentistry is at the left. Because of track work and subway repair, a detour was being in effect with uh, these Kawasaki cars running. Right here, when I was at Penn, I uh, lived a block away and saw 8,000 Peter Witts and PCCs running here. Here is the subway surface portal at 40th between Baltimore and Woodland. Is, it, is this operation LRT or streetcar? If a streetcar, is it a modern streetcar? Does it matter? Air conditioning and lifts are in these cars, even though now they're almost 40 years old. This thing, this thing. Another view. At Gerard, <clears throat> Gerard College at Corinthian Avenue in a 125th anniversary wrap. Basically, electric streetcars were introduced in Philadelphia in 1892, and this was 2017. Here's something similar from the Red Arrow Division 
also the same Pennsylvania five foot two and a quarter gauge with a wrapped double ended car. Note the pantograph instead of the pole. This is car 101 on route 102 Sharon Hill. And it's there for the 100th birthday of the media line. This is at Woodlawn Avenue and Clifton on street trackage. Note the lovely shelf station building or shelter for passengers. Now, Kawasaki car 120 is shown on route 101 in media. The single track in the street has been retained. And yet many people would call this a light rail line because almost all of it is on private right of way. And some of it runs at pretty high speed. Going back to the previous fleet that these Kawasaki cars replaced, we see a St. Louis car built streamliner at Arden at the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum. So these ran on the same tracks back when. And we see the same color scheme or a simplified version of it on the Municipal Railway of San Francisco's F line. This is car 1007, a, actually a Muni torpedo, but we can call it sort of a replica as it's in red arrow colors to honor the operation. This is uh, at Pier 39. And this is on the E and the F line. Here's Muni 1055 at 15th Street and Market Street where Sanchez comes in, the former number 2122, very similar to what is running now in a modernized and reconditioned version in Philadelphia on the Girard Avenue line. The photo is from Beck's Motor Lodge. Uh, and this in a way you can say is not a replica because it's only the wrong city and the gauge. This is an exact Philadelphia PCC in the exact colors that it ran in for many years. Not the original color, but a later color. Anyway, on to what the industry calls modern streetcars. This is a picture at a post at the station that shows a stylized map of the operation. It opened in 2016, it's two and a half miles long with eight stops. It runs on 8th Street and Benning Road. There are six cars on the property. 100 to 102 are Inicon Trio cars and 200 from Czechos the Czech Republic, formerly Czechoslovakia, and 200 to 202 are from Oregon Ironworks or United Streetcar outside of Portland, Oregon. All of them are based on the Skoda Czech pro product, basically the Astra uh, 03T single-ended car. They're of a 70% low floor design. And here is a photo of both types at 8th Street and 2nd Street Northeast, which is right at the beginning of the Hopscot Bridge, which is at the, at the left. This is a view from Union Station Garage approaching the Western terminal of the line. Note the track on the lower right below. Uh, this is an example or the building right in the mid center is an example of the redevelopment and restoration that's desired. Notice what it says, elegant, refined, sensible. And it's missing what it should also say, and with a great view of streetcars and Amtrak. But what can I say? Not everybody is a rail fan. Note the giant supermarket uh, to the back and to the right. Uh, at, and these are condos in an old factory building. So this is what happens when modern streetcars lines are built if they work properly. Now the Hopscot Bridge, which you see here, uh, is really a barrier that's preventing 
the extension of the line into downtown uh, because it has to be rebuilt. But there are plans currently to extend eastward on Benning Road. So the line possibly will be extended. Here's a view on 8th Street between 13th and 14th. Note the dashed line in the pavement. They denote the clearance for parked cars. Drivers must be very careful here not to go over the line. And actually this became an issue before the line was built and it was first in operation as because a lot of drivers were not as careful as they should be. So it became controversial. Here we go to 12th and H. Uh, note the building in the center, it's changing hands. And that's probably for restoration. There's a lot of restoration going on on the line, uh, mostly on the Western portion. Here is 17th and Benning with a uh, Intercon car smiling at you. Uh, Benning is a wider road than H Street, so you don't have the parking problem. In fact, you even have enough room for left turn lanes. Now, this of course uh, is a new streetcar system, but they used to be what we call a legacy system. I don't have any of my slides of them, of those streetcars scanned, but here is one of the uh, Minneapolis Newark PCC cars that have been sold to San Francisco and are running on the F line painted in the old DC transit color scheme. Many, these cars when they were running in Washington DC were maintained very well. And so many of them were sold to places like Barcelona, Sarajevo, and even the Fort Worth Tandy subway. Now we'll move on to Cincinnati. This is a map of the Cincinnati Bell Connector, which was opened on September 9th, 2016. It's run by SORTA, the Southwest Ohio Regional Transportation Authority. It's three and a half miles long. And you, as you can see, it's a figure eight loop. There are 18 stations and five CAF Erbos 3, 100% low floor cars. In fact, America's first low floor cars operate on the line. CAF is a Spanish company, but they uh, built the cars or much of the cars in New York state. These cars are numbered 1175 to 1179, actually picking up from where legacy, the legacy system left off, the legacy system being abandoned in 1951. It's a bit of a busy color scheme. The cars run, uh, many of the legacy cars actually were sold to Toronto. The cars run on a 12 to 15 minute headway. This is a southbound car on Race Street approaching West 12th. So uh, with my uh, cursor, I don't know if you can, if we can get the cursor in here. That's right around here on the line. Uh, you can see the facade of a church. That's the Prince of Peace Lutheran Church built in 1871, way in the background here. A southbound CAF modern streetcar on Walnut Street approaching 3rd Street downtown. Another view at Walnut and 2nd, where the car is about to turn onto 2nd Street for its inner terminal called the Banks. The skyscrapers at the left include the PNC Tower, 31 stories built in 1913, and the Carew Tower, from 1930, which is 49 stories. So this certainly serves the downtown area. Here's the rear of a northbound car heading upgrade from the Ohio River or the bank between third and fourth streets running on Main. 
a northbound car running west on 12th, sort of like where we started, and it's crossing Race Street. One block further along, the building behind the northbound, this northbound car is called the transept. It's a wedding and event space containing a two-story ballroom, but it was originally St. John's German Reformed Protestant Church when it was built in 1867 in this section of Cincinnati, which is called Over the Rhine. And it was settled by German settlers. Washington Park is at the right in the foreground. In fact, there are streetcar tracks running on three sides of Washington Park. Here we're along the car house and shop at the end of the line. In the background, another church, Philippus United Church. And the uh, services were held here until 1921, only in the German language. So the shop and car house is at the left. And here is a photograph taken uh, by slide from Andrew Grahl when he got to Cincinnati before the line actually opened. And as you can see, it was in a different color scheme before Cincinnati Bell took it over. And the yellow and white here uh, at the car house sort of is a reminder to the old uh, colors of Cincinnati PCCs. And here's a photograph of uh, one of the cars uh, a Philadelphia car, actually, like the 2100s, uh, and that recognizes Cincinnati. Uh, very similar color, very building is in the back. Now we go on to Detroit, which is another modern streetcar line, an official modern streetcar line. The uh, name is, called, is the Q line. And that stands for Quicken Loans. Uh, the line was built by private interests wanting to rebuild the city. It opened on May 12, 2017, along mainly Woodward Avenue, which is like a main drag of uh, Detroit. It's 3.3 miles long with 12 stops. And they have six Brookville dual mode Liberty streetcars. They're 70% low floor, and they're numbered 287 to 292, similar to Cincinnati, taking off after the abandoned legacy system. And that was abandoned in 1956. Notice no wire. Quote, it is said that the use of overhead on streetcar or light rail lines can destroy views in the area, end quote. This was first developed in France near churches and historic sites in places like Bordeaux and Nice, for example. Uh, these cars run on dual mode DC current and chargeable batteries and the line is about half wireless. The previous picture was, uh, let me, Go back to it. Uh, that's Our Lady of Rosary, a Romanesque church in the background. Here we're at the northern terminal of the line, Grand Boulevard. It's wireless here. And you can see a ramp on the left foreground uh, that just leads up from the street to uh, the door position because these low floor cars obviously don't scrape along the pavement. Now here's on the upper part of the line where the cars get recharged. This is the layover just north of the Grand Station. And of course, uh, the car has to be positioned very carefully under the 750 volts. Uh, another view uh, showing uh, the car getting charged. So they do have to lay over for a few minutes. They can't just go right into there and come right back out. 
And if you look toward the rear, you'll see tracks turning off to the right. Uh, they run into the Penske Technical Center, is a three track car house and shop for the line. But wireless is not new. Conduit operation in New York City, Washington, London, and Paris preceded wireless operation of today by a very long time. This is Times Square in New York. Uh, the Winter Garden Theater in the background is now a legitimate theater uh, between, on Broadway between 50th and 51st. Uh, Third Avenue Railway's most modern lightweight cars, uh, 75 Huff Liners, named after S.W. Huff, the president who started in 1918. And that's what you see on the left side. It's sort of a Peter Witt design, but double-ended. 25 of these cars were sent to San Paulo after the Manhattan system was abandoned in late 1946, early 1947. These were built because in the uh, Third Avenue shops because the Third Avenue could not afford buying PCCs but they were pretty modern cars. And certainly San Paulo liked them. There's one in preservation in San, at the uh, Trolley Museum in Santos and it's operable. And there are many of these cars are plinths in San Paulo and various other cities in Brazil. Okay, back to Detroit. Uh, this is Borough Street. But, below Amsterdam. Uh, the line is partly uh, running along the curb and partly in the center of the street. And this is where basically it transitions. Uh, no wire at this point. Now we come to the art museum in the background. And this is photograph from the library. And here we have overhead. So one would think here with these, the library is also a very attractive building, would be an area where you don't want overhead because of the view. The Detroit line serves a number of traffic generators. And uh, in the foreground is Comerica Park, where the Detroit Tigers play, and right behind it is Ford Field, where the Detroit Lions football team is housed. And this is Elizabeth Street in the foreground. This is at the Grand Circus, Central United Methodist Church, uh, is to the right, and uh, St. John's Episcopal is behind it. This is from the elevated people mover stop, and we'll get a quick picture of that a little later. Um, this is right below that, right below the people mover structure, and this is the, from the structure on the left is where I did the preceding photograph. There's no stop here, unfortunately. So it's hard to get a photo, and I did wait, of both a people mover car and a modern street car together. But also notice the tall downtown buildings here in Detroit. The people mover opened in eight, 1987, and it's rail, it's single track, but it's like the Vancouver SkyTrain and the air train here at Kennedy Airport in New York and actually the Scarborough line in Toronto. Uh, cost 75 cents to ride that, but the line is currently suspended. It had operated clockwise, uh, but they decided right before COVID to change the direction of the line to counterclockwise to uh, combat wear and tear on the rail. So presumably when it does come back, it will, continue, it will go back to counterclockwise. It's a 13 stop loop, three miles in length, 
with 12 vehicles built by the UTDC in Canada. Heading into downtown terminal, and there's no wire right here. Uh, actually, the line runs on two parallel streets briefly, while Woodward Avenue goes straight ahead. But as you pull into the foreground and come to the end where you change ends, uh, you've got the pantograph up, up under a stretch of wire, similar to what you saw at the northern end of the line. Now we'll go back a little further up the line because uh, there, before Quicken Loans took over, uh, this billboard announced the start of service and notice that the, CA, the uh, Brooklyn Liberty car is painted red. The view is from the uh, Edgeville Ford Freeway uh, right in the area of Wayne State University. Um, the Art Deco Fisher Building, Bodies by Fisher, named after the seven Fisher brothers, uh, is on the left side and it's now an entertainment venue. Uh, they sold their auto body company to General Motors in 1926. The three story, uh, it has a three story lobby. Uh, the building uh, right to the right of the billboard is the old uh, Cadillac neoclassical General Motors building and uh, GM has moved out and it's now in the Renaissance Center. But anyway, the cars were supposed to be red and another slide from Andrew Graal shows them in the red color, shows one of them at least, in the red color scheme being prepared for shipment to Detroit from Brookville, Pennsylvania. So that's the same color as the billboard, but just like in Cincinnati, very quickly the color changed before the cars went into service. With the same idea in mind, here's a picture on the Muni F line of a car celebrating Detroit. This is a ex Newark car at the ferry building. And notice the difference uh, between the colors. They're both red, but uh, here cream predominates. On from Detroit to Milwaukee. Now, basically, we're going across the country and then counterclockwise down the West Coast and back uh, through the southern area to uh, display these. Um, and this is from a road trip in 2019. Uh, Milwaukee is 90 miles north of Chicago on Lake Michigan and used to be connected to Chicago. Uh, by the Chicago North Shore and Milwaukee Railway, which ran uh, in two hours through the loop. The city, like Cincinnati, was settled by Germans. This is uh, the art museum uh, designed by Santiago Calatrava back in 2001. The hop opened on November 2018. It's two miles 2.1 miles long, and it also uh, has a wireless section about five eighths of a mile in length. Now, uh, the question is, why is it called the hop? Well, Milwaukee is famous for, for its breweries. Perhaps the, it's named after uh, the hops that go into beer. But my gut says that was not the reason. So I think they want you to hop on and hop off. Here's a map of it at a uh, shelter. You can see that there are two parallel streets that carry the cars one way uh, in the downtown area. And the line zigzags along its route. Yes, wrong. Brookville, it uses Brookville Liberty cars just like Detroit. The car houses below that highway, I-74, and this is on Phillips Avenue. And basically the line is supported by the, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, the P 
Powatomi Hotel and Casino. Certainly not a German name, but they uh, have at the casino Hoppenings. It's a 12 year name deal and the fair is free for now. On St. Paul, this is the southern end of the line near the intermodal rail bus station. We're crossing the Milwaukee River into the historic third ward as per part of the sign that you see. Uh, it's sort of an area on the right side, on the other side of the river, that's very much like Greenwich Village in New York. There's a lot of, uh, oops, press the wrong button. A lot of boutiques, bars, restaurants, shops. This is uh, Broadway in downtown. And you can see there's construction going on. And that was the purpose, partly the purpose of the line. And here's another view from a garage of the operation coming down Broadway. One of the major stops is called Cathedral Square. In the background is City Hall on the left, built in 1895. This is on Kilbourne Avenue. And the pillared building in the background is the Milwaukee County Court. <clears throat> Around the corner, this is Jackson, uh, and the car is running onto Kilbourne, Kilbourne. Milwaukee Bucks, one car was painted for them, but uh, when we were there, the playoffs were about to begin and there was a lot of basketball fe fever. Unfortunately, the Bucks lost to the Toronto Raptors in the playoffs. Now we go up some more on Jackson. And here's a view of a car turning onto Jackson from Ogden. At this point, the wire is up and the pantographs are up. A little further down, they're not. Uh, this is a photo showing the uh, Panograph half the way up because uh, right here is where they changed. And uh, the pan is being lowered. Outbound beyond here with the wire toward Ogden, uh, a lot of the line is basically an older residential area and it's quite attractive. So all in all, this is a modern streetcar line. It's doing quite well and it's in both patronage and in the fact that there's a lot of development going on. Now we move just a little bit south of Milwaukee to Kenosha. Uh, this is considered a heritage streetcar line, but in my opinion, it, they utilize modern PCC cars. So some people will say this is vintage. It's in front of the car house shop. The line opened in the year 2000. It's a single track counterclockwise loop. Serves the Chicago and Northwestern, now Union Pacific Station, where commuter trains run to Chicago. It's 1.7 miles long with 18 stops, $2 fare, uh, half fare for seniors. I believe the uh, trucks on these cars, because Toronto was wide gauge, came from spam cans in uh, Chicago. And the cars are a little bit rough riding, I think, as a result. But they have six of these Toronto PCCs plus two SEPTA PCCs celebrating Chicago, Johnstown, Toronto, Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, Muni, and SEPTA. And Two of the cars came from East Troy. Uh, when ERA had two of its conventions here, many cars were out on the road and you could get photos of all the different color schemes. 
It basically runs through the Harbor Park development, which is, which is on the ex-American Motors factory grounds. This is Second Avenue with some very attractive station furniture, flowers, and of course, the American flag. So Kenosha is a vintage line, but it certainly uses a modern streetcar. Now we move on to the St. Louis Loop Trolley, which is really not a modern streetcar line. But let's take a look at Gateway Arch, our introduction to St. Louis, 630 feet high, designed by Aero Sarnanen in 1960, opened in 1967. He also built the terminals for Dul at Dulles Airport and the TWA terminal, now a hotel at JFK Airport. The purpose of this was to renew water, the waterfront and to celebrate westward expansion, which started in St. Louis. It's a major tourist attraction. And one can say the idea of this is the same as the idea of running streetcars. From November 2018 to December 2019, before COVID, but at, until the operation ran out of money, th this ran in the section of St. Louis called Del Mar Loop. Uh, it's a neighborhood uh, probably named originally for the streetcars on the Del Mar line looping there in University City. This, the line covers part of University City and St. Louis. It's 2.2 miles long with 10 stops. But because of severe money shortages, it only operated starting at 12 noon each day and only on Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. Uh, it's mostly double track on Del Mar Boulevard, basically a, an L-shaped route. And paid for by businesses and St. Louis interests to uh, renew this area of St. Louis because it's a major uh, entertainment area with lots of restaurants, movie theaters and the like. Here's a map of it uh, at the University City end. Uh, Route 10 used to loop at this end as I mentioned before. The uh, signs give you the ticket prices and basically instruct you on how to ride the streetcar. Notice that um, the cars just go back and forth. There's no really loop on it. Well, the original plan for this had single-ended Milan Peter Witt cars and uh, this area down here was going to be a total loop. And up here where we are at University City Library, the line was going to loop around the street like the old number 10 line, but that changed. Whoops. And here we're leaving the University City Station. Um, we've got a multi, uh, set traffic light here to let the streetcars out. And then traffic stops in all four directions at this point. Further along the line, we reach the Del Mar station. Uh, this is going, it become, after the double track, it becomes a single track line. And this station was built by the Wabash Railroad in 1929, sort of like an uptown station, like 125th Street is for New York. And you used to be able to get trains up until the days of Amtrak to Chicago and Detroit from here, as well as to Kansas City and the West Coast uh, via the United Union Pacific from the station. Uh, Here's another view at the station 
back uh, in the days right after it was built, uh, probably in the early 1930s. The Metrolink, which is the light rail system for St. Louis, runs on the Wabash tracks and basically goes right under the station building with the station here. Uh, there's another point where the uh, St. Louis Loop Trolley meets the Metrolink light rail line, and that's at its end at Forest Park. Oh, here's at the uh, Del Mar station, the two uh, Brookville cars passing each other. Now these uh, came from Portland, Oregon. They were built for a vintage trolley operation in Portland, uh, both for Portland Streetcar and for Max. And uh, when that was shut down, uh, two of the cars were sold to St. Louis for the loop trolley with the other two going to the Willamette Shore Railway. Uh, they were built to by Gomaco to resemble council crest cars that used to run on the narrow gauge Portland system. Very much Brill design. Further up, there's another passing siding where sometimes the two cars meet. They're supposed to meet at, at Del Mar but traffic sometimes gets in the way and you never would know what's going to happen. Uh, here is the third car, 003. If you notice the other two cars were 001 and 002. It has just uh, been renovated by Gomaco and just last week it was out on the street running uh, or testing. This is an ex-Melbourne, uh, Australia car, and it uh, was refurbished by uh, Gomaco. So this will be the third car in the operation. I think it may be reopened to a certain extent right now, but I don't know when this car will go into service. This photograph is from Andy Sisk of St. Louis, and he was I guess he got the word that the car was out and rushed to get a photo of it. This is uh, a similar sign uh, advertising a car stop uh, on the De Balavir. The other picture was also on the Balavir. That's the on the other direction, uh, perpendicular to Del Mar Boulevard. Uh, this one is interesting because it also shows the PCC cars that operated on the legacy system. And we'll take a close up view of that. Um, and there are two St. Louis built St. Louis um, streetcars. Now notice the, uh, the building here. You'll see that again. This is what the Balavir used to look like. Uh, there's the same building on the left. Uh, the street is not nearly as busy these days and half the street was taken away for the single track streetcar line. So basically the same location as here, but nowadays. And here's a car honoring St. Louis on, the, on Muni in San Francisco. Uh, very close to the color scheme. And this is uh, near Pier 39 on the E and F lines. And here's another one oper honoring a streetcar line that ran into St. Louis from Illinois, the Illinois Terminal Railroad, which ran suburban service with double-ended PCCs up until 1958. And it ran into urbans into St. Louis uh, up until a few years earlier, all the way from Peoria. Uh, this is a double-ended torpedo just painted to honor the St. Louis base. Illinois Terminal Railway. Now we'll take a detour, a diversion, 
and go to French Lick, Indiana, a very small town, population only 800, about three and a quarter hour drive, 230 miles from St. Louis. Uh, the French Link Lick Springs Hotel, which was built in 1845 uh, and was a resort and still is a resort. And uh, it ran a streetcar line to West Baden Springs, uh, which is uh, now another hotel under the same management. Uh, and they're both spas, 1.3 miles, single track line and uh, using a very nostalgic looking streetcar. But we'll see a little more about that. Here's the inner terminal at the hotel, at the casino of the hotel. And you can see it's now set for high level platforms and there are some hotel guests ready to board it. And here's the other end at the West Baden Spring Hotel. And generally both have, both have restaurants. There's a lot of lunch, lunch trade going back and forth and both have golf courses. Here's another view of car number one, the only car that runs on the line. And that's the curve leading from French Lick into West Baden. And this is what preceded it from 1903 to 1919. And that's why it's running today because of historical reasons. Uh, the hotel built uh, a streetcar between French Lick and West Baden over a hundred years ago. That lasted until 1919. But they decided to restore and run a new trolley and restored the tracks. And this is what it looked like between 1987 and 2002. This is a real type car from Porto, number, 13, number 313, a home built to a real design. And uh, the line goes right past this right now, except it turns left. And here's a view of it also in the Porto uh, body. And so it was converted to diesel uh, after the line quit in 2002. So it ran from 1987 for a second time to 2002 and then reopened. It, much later and is now continuing to run. And so um, this is the same car, first running under electric and now running under diesel power. Okay, back to modern streetcars. That certainly wasn't. This is, we now move on to Kansas City, Missouri, where on May 6, 2006, the Kansas City authorities, two plus miles, streetcar line opened, has 10 stops and four CAF Erbo streetcars with two more uh, now online. So they're numbered 801 to 806, only four when I was there. And the line is run by Herzog. And they're very friendly. The Kansas City legacy system quit in 1959, the last PCC's number was 799. So these cars are 801 to 806. And they're the same uh, Spanish cars, 100% uh, low floor. Operation is by Herzog. And this is in the Singleton Yard, which is where their shops are located at the northern end of the line. And here is a map of the line. You can see at the northern end, it loops around. And River Market North is the northernmost station. For the most part, it runs on Main Street. And this is the southern end at Union Station. 
this was once a major hub uh, for railroads. And now it only sees a few Amtrak trains, the Southwest Sheep and the mules that run to uh, St. Louis. Uh, Pershing Road crosses here and the line will be extended southward from here. Uh, everything is in place for that southward extension. And actually it'll be extended northward as well. Here's the view crossing the railroad tracks and heading into the uh, Union Station terminal. A closer view of the skyline along eight, from 18th Street. Cars run on a 10 minute headway. The Kansas City Power and Light 34 story building from 1931 is shown on the left. It's now apartments. And that was that the Hilton President Hotel. The dark brooding looking building is one Kansas City place, 42 stories and built in 1987. The circular building at the right is the world headquarters for H&R Block. And that's 17 floors from 2006. The vertical sign for the uh, Alamo Draft House Theater is a reincarnation of a 1921 vaudeville and movie theater. So Kansas City has done a lot for its downtown and this aims to do a lot more. Uh, this view is from 13th and Main, and it shows a, pedest a, pedest a pedestrian overpass. Uh, both sides of the street are vibrant, uh, a lot of people around. When it leaves downtown going north, uh, it gets into a more sparsely uh, developed area. And this is a view from a garage between 7th and 8th Street. Right near here, a little bit to the right, is something called the Muse of Missouri. And it's a statue between 8th and 9th Street. And uh, it came in 1963. And the Missouri that it's talking about is the river, not the state. As you probably know, Kansas City is in Missouri. And there's another Kansas City across the river in Kansas that's much smaller. Here's where it goes into the loop. This is with a telephoto lens at along Fifth Street. And this is running into an area that's getting very popular for shopping and shops. Uh, a lot of these buildings are being converted into condos and a lot of stores are opening. Uh, this is the River Market North, end of the line, very close to the car house. This is at Fifth and Delaware on the end of the loop heading back to downtown Kansas City. And uh, one of the old PCC cars is displayed here. So uh, this is a picture I got from the internet. This is not one that I took myself, but uh, it's an inter interesting place to get a photograph. The car wasn't there when I visited Kansas City, but now it has been moved. It had been moved from place to place. So Kansas City also is honored by Muni, but um, this is a Philly car at the ferry building, and it honors, of course. Kansas City. <clears throat> My voice is getting a little hoarse. On to Portland. And in the old days before Amtrak, you could ride the Portland Rose, a Union Pacific train from Kansas City to Portland and operate and arrive at that station. Uh, it bypassed uh, on the Union Pacific, the Salt Lake City area where there is a modern streetcar, 
but we will not be showing that tonight since I haven't been to Salt Lake City since it opened. Um, when the ERA had its Denver Salt Lake City convention, the line was just under construction. Anyway, Portland is very hospitable to rail fans and the go by train sign at Union Station is iconic. It's been around for many years. In fact, when I visited Portland for the first time in the days before Amtrak, uh, passenger uh, visitors were allowed on the platforms to see off passengers, which is something that's a real big no-no for Amtrak today. Anyway, this is a view of a MAX train, a, low, <clears throat> a partly low floor car uh, with the go by train Union Station in the background. And here is another view with the same Union Station in the background of one of the same cars that we saw running in St. Louis. But at that point, it was running in a uh, heritage service on weekends and holidays on the MAX line. Anyway, with go by train, the streetcars had to get something similar. So we also have go by streetcar. The MAX light rail line was introduced in 1986, but it didn't reach that point that we showed showed on the previous slide here until 2009. Again, <coughs> the Portland streetcar, which we're showing now, was opened on July 20th, 2001. And basically one could argue that this was the first of all the new streetcar lines considering that Philadelphia, Boston, New Orleans were legacy ones. Uh, this is the streetcar lost condominium at 11th and Lovejoy. Uh, the line has been extended in multiple times and now is 7.2 miles long. And it runs in a loop with 17 cars of the Skoda, uh, 10T design based on the O3T from the Czech Republic. Uh, 17 cars are on the line. Uh, they're 70% low floor. Cars one to seven, which came right at the beginning uh, and are similar to the ones running in Washington DC and Tacoma were built by Skoda uh, eight to 10 uh, come, came in 2006. And they're the, the second type for Washington DC. And they were also running in Seattle and Tacoma and they were built by Inicon and they had the smiley face. And the remaining cars number 15 from 2009 and 21 to 26, which also run in Tucson were built in 2012 to 2014 by United Streetcars. So we'll take a, take a look at, at those. All of the color schemes of the cars uh, basically are two colors. Ah, oh, my wife has just given me a glass of juice. Would you like Coke? Yeah, I'll take Coke. Okay. And we'll just take a look at them. Uh, each side of the car is painted in one of the colors, of the two colors, and the front and end or the, is painted in the same two colors. Uh, number 021 on the left is the United Streetcar product, and it is quite slightly different in its uh, exterior from 007 on the right, uh, the James Bond car which is a Skoda product. And this is at 4th and Montgomery. The third type of car is the Inicon. This is number eight at 4th and Harrison. And that's with the smiley face on the front. Here we have a look at Oregon Ironworks in Clackamas of car 15, 
which was the first, the prototype built uh, with cooperation from the Federal Transit Administration, as you can see. And this photo was taken at an ERA convention in Portland where we visited the manufacturing plant right at the beginning where United Streetcar was really looking forward to becoming a major supplier. Sadly, the market was not that big. They made a few mistakes and the only other United Streetcar cars that are around are in, is the fleet in Tucson. Here's a map uh, that shows the system. Uh, the red line is the streetcar. And they've got three lines. One is called the north-south line, which runs this way and all the way down. And then they've got two loop lines in clockwise and counterclockwise that run around the loop and over this way and then back up. Basically, they're circular lines. We'll take a look at uh, some cars on these lines going in this clockwise direction, first along the Broadway Bridge. Crosses the, <clears throat> the Willamette River to the east side of town. Here's another view from uh, the Southeast Morrison Bridge uh, at Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard, which is where the loop line runs. Now it's single track on two parallel streets because the loops run in both directions. Now we go to the beautiful Silicon Crossing, the cable stayed bridge from 2015. And it's shared by light rail vehicles of the orange line of the Portland Max light rail system and the and on the Milwaukee to Milwaukee, Oregon, not Milwaukee, Wisconsin. That's where the orange line goes. And the Portland trolley. So here again, they have the question, modern trolley, light rail, but they're certainly compatible enough to run on the same tracks. And this is the junction from the east side. And here's a view of the bridge at the junction on the west side. And you can see the cars on both sides of the bridge quickly switch onto their own tracks once they've crossed this pedestrian and bus bridge and bicycles, of course, not at all uh, for automobiles. So Portland likes that very much. And it's certainly easy to photograph cars on the bridge because you're not going to have automobiles get in the way, just the occasional bus. Okay, this is on the southern part of the line. Um, basically on a loop that runs to South Portland. In the background uh, is the, uh, they call this area South Waterfront, is the Portland Aerial Tram. And that runs uh, to the main campus from Moody Street, it was opened in 2006. It's a Doblemeyer Dobel, cable operation. Um, it's expensive. And uh, while well, students get to ride it free, and monthly regular pass holders on the Portland uh, transit system get to ride it free, everyone else has to pay a there. It goes 500 feet up and it's 3,300 feet long. Now on this trackage through here, although it looked differently, this originally was part of a uh, interurban line, which became the Willamette Street <clears throat> Heritage Museum streetcar. So here was a museum line that has now been partially taken over by regular transit with streetcars. And behind me it is the new terminal of the Willamette streetcar. Here's 
here's another view uh, coming back on that loop south of the bridge of the rear of a car, one of the Inacons. And uh, you can see the building on the left is new. There's a lot of development. The Portland trolley has, the Portland streetcar, I should say, has worked. And this is on, along Moody Street, uh, just after the streetcar service took over from the Willamette Shore Museum line. And it was basically on the private right of way that was used by the museum line. Uh, this is an Enicon car. <coughs> this has been relocated now onto the street, but these photos are from the previous days. And the street on the right now has double track uh, for these streetcars. And that's the interchange of I-5 and I-405. It then runs through Portland State University, which is another traffic generator. And this is view for, a view from one of the buildings of the university. Um, uh, you look towards the rear. This is not a single track line. The uh, other direction runs here. And this is Max running through here and you've You've got the Portland streetcar. So it's a very complex junction around that spot. And one last picture. This is at south, between um, Southwest 5th and 6th. This is the loop uh, showing a Max LRV and one of the vintage cars that they were using at the time. Uh, I don't know if that's still the case. But all riders, max riders had to get off before the loop and then could board after the loop. For some reason, they did not want anybody on board while the cars traversed the loop. Of course, that wasn't true when you had a fan trip. Now we move on to Seattle, further up north along the Pacific coast. There are two modern streetcar lines at the present moment. One is the South Lake Union streetcar, which is shown here. And that runs to a lake, which they didn't picture. And um, they say that when it originally opened in 2007, it was called the South Lake Union trolley which initials spell slut. And if you ride this line and go to various stores, you can get t-shirts that say slut. But um, the company operating it prefers it be called South Lake Union Streetcar. The other modern streetcar is this one shown in red. It's called the First Hill Streetcar. It opened in 2016. Um, there are plans as you can see with the dashed lines to connect the two. This is the outer end of the line at the Fred, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. The line, this, the SLUS line is 1.3 miles long with 11 stops and part of it is on parallel street. It uses three Inacon streetcars. Um, the number 301 to 303. Uh, this is at the outer end at Fairview Avenue, where for layups, the double tracks turn into single. Um, Here is the only section of private right of way on the line. Uh, the lake is to the left here. This is Valley Street. Uh, when I visited it for the first time, the three cars were painted in three beautiful pastel colors, which I really liked. 
they now have advertising on them. Here is uh, Westlake Avenue, and maybe you see the lake in the background here. So, uh, taken from Mercer Street, there are a lot of high tech companies located on the continuation of the street going outbound. How many of their employees ride the streetcar <laughs> versus driving their Mercedes? That I don't know. And now from a later visit with advertising, this is a 7th and Westlake. And another of the cars painted in blue at the Westlake Transit Center, which is where the cars connect with both the Seattle monorail and the light rail transit system, which is in a subway underground at this point. Here's a view at Westlake and Thomas. You can see the cars are running on the curb lane. Now we go to the first hill line. Um, when I was there, they were running only test service and only one car was on the line. I was with the late Phil Stevenson and we were very lucky they were running anything. So we were really uh, happy that we could get a few photos. The line runs from the Link Light Rail Transit from Pioneer Square, which is uh, near the King Street Railroad Station up Capitol Hill. Uh, it uses, it has seven uh, Intercon streetcars that also have wireless capability. The three on the Lake Union line uh, are strictly uh, electric uh, using a DC current. This is at Jackson and 7th Street and notice the overhead here, including trolley bus wire. The trolley bus also runs on that street. And this was taken in 2015. It turns the corner and this is the point uh, on, at 14th and Washington where uh, the line is going to convert from wireless to wire, but only for inbound downtown headed streetcars. Basically, the line that continues up the hill has wire here, and the line going down the hill does not have wire. So that's sort of an interesting spot, and this can be crossover can be used for short-term cars. So uh, here's another view of the line. And this is uh, the point where we had the wireless portion converting to, to wire. This is the connection that is not built and one doesn't know if it's going to be built. It's been uh, on again, off again. And here's the South Lake Union portion of it. And we have come to the end of part one. So bear with me while I switch over to part two of Modern Streetcars. And here we're going to do a lot of looking at San Francisco. And I want to start with a car painted in Newark color scheme because <clears throat> I live near Newark, New Jersey, in New Jersey, in Montclair. And San Francisco, of course, is the West Coast answer to New York City with a huge number of different rail transit operations, 
Smart, Smart, Caltrain, Muni Metros, Light Rail, Cable Cars, and finally Streetcars. Now, are these streetcars that are shown here modern streetcars? Again, it's the eye of the beholder. <coughs> modern streetcars glide down Market Street and the Embarcadero. The cars don't need lifts as the stations have them, at least most of them. And there is you room inside for wheelchairs. And they don't need air conditioning either because there's rarely a hot day in San Francisco. The PCCs are painted in color schemes that such cars sported in many North American cities as a tribute to them and to make them of interest to many tourists who may still remember them. Basically a nostalgia trip. Or maybe the different colors are just done for electric traction fans like us. Whatever the case, we're happy that they're set up this way. Mm -hmm. The PCC cars are supplemented, or should I say abetted by historic cars from San Francisco and many other cities around the world. Surely a vintage fleet, if you want to consider PCC cars vintage. We're gonna look at Muni's lines E and F from one end to the other. And I've tried to vary the views to include as many different color schemes and heritage cars as I could based on those pictures that I have scanned. First thing I wanna talk about is authenticity. Because if you take a Philadelphia PCC car and paint it in a Kansas City color, we really can't say that's an authentic. But San Francisco does have a number of authentic cars, because, except for their numbers and their location being in San Francisco. Um, this is a Newark car painted in Newark colors. If it were running in the Newark City subway, you'd think it's perfectly normal. Uh, Newark, of course, doesn't have a ferry building, which you see in the background, but it does have a ferry street. And that's where these cars were shopped and repainted before going into service in 1953, as they came from Minneapolis. These, they were built by St. Louis Car for the Twin City Rapid Transit Company and sold to Newark as well as Shaker Heights and Mexico City. Now San Francisco has 11 of them and they were refurbished by Brookville in 2002. This car 1070 was Twin City Rapid Transit 333 and public service number 14. This one from the same batch was Twin Cities 362 and Public Service 23. So same type of car in same location and I call it authentic because these cars operated in their those color schemes in their respective cities. Here's another authentic car, a Philadelphia PCC I showed one of these before, number 1055, uh, 1948 built 2100 series, which originally had some silver on the roof, but it ran in this color scheme in Philadelphia for many years. Uh, these were refurbished and rebuilt by Morris and Knudsen in 1995. So I say this is authentic, Philadelphia, car in Philadelphia colors. Obviously authentic would be San Francisco cars in San Francisco colors. 1008 shown on Market Street is an original Mu Muni torpedo built in 1948. When I first visited San Francisco, they were running in as single-ended cars, 
but originally they were double-ended. And in uh, 2010 to 2011, Brookville uh, rebuilt them into uh, double-ended cars, at least seven of the original 10 that had been purchased from the St. Louis Car Company. And the last of my authentic cars is number 1040, built by St. Louis Car in 1952 for Muni. In fact, it was the last PCC of almost 5,000 that were built in the United States. So now let's just follow the line a little bit. Uh, we'll start, the F line is called Market and Wharves, and it runs from Jones and Beach in Fisherman's Wharf to Out Market Street and the Embarcadero to 17th and Castro uh, for six miles. It has 32 stops, a very frequent headway. Uh, and gradually increased from when I first uh, saw the F line in operation. It's been so popular, and more and more passengers rode it. I'm talking about before COVID. So that uh, new additional cars were ordered and uh, headways were uh, decreased. It started at, as a summer trolley festival in both 1982 and 1983 because uh, the cable car system in San Francisco was out of service being rehabilitated. And it was so popular even after the cable cars came back, it was extended to 1987. Uh, they decided to make it permanent in 1995, replacing the eight Market Street trolley bus. It uses PCCs, Milan Peter Witts, and heritage cars from all over the world. The Embarcadero Freeway, which is now a boulevard, was torn down in 1989 and tracks were installed on the replacement opening in the year 2000. This is number 1077, Birmingham Tribute and one of the newer cars. This is the last stop with the ferry building across the street and the stop is right behind the car where the E and the F line split up. Now we go a little further north of there and we're gonna to head to Fisherman's Wharf. We see 1079 in the Detroit paint scheme and a lovely sculpture on the left. And you can see that the right of way in pavement is between the lanes of traffic. So you still have traffic running down the Embarcadero, but the streetcars on these lines run without automobile interference for the most part. Whoops. Okay, number 1076, a newer car painted in the DC transit color scheme is a bit further up on the line. And this is looking towards the ferry building as you can see. Going still further up, we have 1063 honoring Baltimore at Pier 35. The odd numbered piers run north from the ferry building and many cruise ships uh, stop at these. And when the cruise ships unload, these cars are just loaded with passengers because the first thing that many of them want to do, at least those who have not paid the high prices for the uh, cruise companies uh, excursions want to do is they get on these streetcars. So when you're there at that time, uh, you can be delayed a lot, but the streetcars really soak up the passengers. This is also where the right of way gets reorganized from the center to sort of the side of the road. Uh, here's one of my favorite cars, number 737. This is a Brussels PCC built in 1952 by Les Bourgeois. And it's honoring uh, Zurich, actually. Uh, these cars never ran in Zurich. It's in the Zurich color scheme, but Zurich is a sister city to uh, San Francisco. 
and they're really handsome, in my opinion. Here's one uh, a tribute to Chicago, uh, car 1058, and the traffic lanes are now in the middle, just a little bit further than the previous pictures going towards Fisherman Wharf. Number 578 is one of the prize of the Market Street Railway Museum's collection. It was built in 1896. Uh, the single trucker is approaching Pier 39. You can see it's coming down from uh, Pier 39, I'm sorry, uh, which you can see in the background. Uh, possibly the oldest streetcar running in regular service on a legitimate streetcar line in the world. It's a, you can see it's a California style with open Porsches on either end. It was built by the Hammond Car Company and had become a sand car. And that's why it lasted so long. Ten oh nine is a torpedo running alongside the aquarium and painted in Dallas colors. Now Dallas had double-ended PCCs as well, but they didn't quite look like that. Further up at Pier 39, which is where you can get the boat to Alcatraz for a tour. Uh, generally, they don't sell one-way tickets, uh, but I know. I, one person I'd like to give one to. Uh, and there's a lot of, of amusements and restaurants at Pier 39. So it's a very popular place. And you can see passengers lining up to get on the authentic torpedo. This is Melbourne SWA six type car 916, which was built in 1946. And I've taken it from an overhead crossing that leads to a garage. Uh, there's a short turn loop right below that. And here's a view of 578, the 1896 built car on that loop laying over. Further up, the line curves uh, onto Jefferson Street in the North Point District. And this is uh, a Muni Iron Monster car, uh, which is what a lot of the cars were called, uh, built in 1914. Actually, this one was saved by the uh, OERM in Paris, California, before it was bought by the Market Street Railway. So it was very lucky that Orange Empire actually saved it. And again, the line, the area is very popular. Look at all the pedestrians. Going a little further and on Jefferson, uh, on the curve that leads toward the end of the line is a Philadelphia car painted in Louisville colors uh, at Fisherman's Wharf. Uh, Fisherman Wharf, of course, is a tourist destination with Italian restaurants, a lot of schlock, for, uh, it's a fun place to be. Right behind it is car 1893, a Peter Witt from Milan built in 1928. The Peter Witts from Milan reflect three different color schemes. Uh, the, a yellow one, which you don't see here from the late twenties, a green one, which we'll see later from the thirties to the sixties and the orange one, that's been used from 1970s into the present. Streetcars just like this still operate in Milan. And here is a car in 74, a newer car uh, honoring Toronto on that same curve from Jefferson to Jones in front of a restaurant. The cars lay over right next to the Walgreens on Jones. And this is a tribute to the Los Angeles transit line. Their fruit salad color scheme. 
is also a Los Angeles railway, a predecessor to LATL, a car painted in their color scheme, but we won't be seeing that tonight. So the crews get off here, they take a break and they get back on and drive away. Turning the corner and heading back towards the ferry building, this is number 1010, a torpedo that is honoring San Francisco's original magic carpet cars that had been painted in that blue and yellow paint scheme. They were not PCCs because the law did not allow San Francisco's municipal railway to pay royalties. So they had hand control and were missing a lot of other features. But nevertheless, they look, the magic carpet cars of which one is uh, running at uh, the Western Railway Museum in Rio Vista uh, look a bit like PCCs. And this car is painted to look like them. This is, um, Beach and Stockton uh, very much coming back towards Pier 39. And now here we have one of the green Peter Witts from Milan. And that's opposite, we're going, we're back at the ferry building and that's opposite the outbound ferry building stop. Ten seventy three, a newer car honors El Paso. And El Paso is one system that we might want to call a modern streetcar line. I would call it that, but the industry might not. This is <clears throat> right beyond the inbound uh, stop for the ferry building for the E and F lines. Notice the flags on the dashboard representing Mexico and the United States. So now we're going to follow the E line southward. It started as a weekend only operation in 2008 and now runs daily, COVID permitting, to Fourth and King, mostly over the route of Muni's, Muni Metro's NNT uh, light rail lines. Started running full time in 2015 and 2016. And our first photo opposite the ferry building is of Melbourne W2 496, which was built in 1928. And it's marked Caltrain, which is where the terminal is located at 4th and King. And trains from San Jose and Gilmore run up to the Caltrain terminal. So it's an intermodal spot. Here's a side view of Peter Witt 1815, just south of the ferry building. Now, back in the 1960s in Milan, they converted from trolley poles to pantographs. And the Peter Witts there still run with pantographs, but here they're back to the original trolley poles. Another picture. This is 1859 at the portal where the N and T lines come out of the Muni Metro subway. And the tracks join, and now the E line follows those tracks. Further down on the line, with the San Francisco Bay Bridge in the background, the pride of the Market Street Railways collection, Muni car number one, built in 1912 by W.L. Holman. That car has been rebuilt many times and always looks good. This is at uh, Bannon Street and this uh, act, it's just a beautiful double-ended car. Looking at the other direction Basically at the same point, we have a Muni Torpedo number 1011 in Market Street Railways colors or what would probably have been Market Street Railways 
color because they never got PCCs. And in 1944, Muni took over the Market Street Railway. This is not to be confused with the current rail fan and museum group and basically the sponsors of the ENF line, at, uh, which is also called the Market Street Railway. Here's number one at Oracle Park at Third and King. Uh, and the, the baseball stadium was built in 2000, originally named Pacific Bell Park. Then it became SBC Park for Southwest Bell. Then when Southwest Bell bought AT&T and renamed itself AT&T, it became AT&T Park. And anyway, some people uh, here it's labeled AT&T Park, but it's now Oracle Park because the naming rights have been bought by that big tech company. But a lot of people still call it Pac Bell Park. And here's 1009, the Dallas Torpedo at the end of the line. Uh, Notice the center platform, which is high level for the Muni Metro's end line, and to the left, the side platform, which is low level for the E line at this fourth and King terminal. The Caltrain terminal is out of the picture to the left. Uh, basic, on the line that runs from the portal to this point, the uh, Muni Metro cars stop at different platforms uh, than these cars. Here is car 1057, a Philadelphia unit painted for Cincinnati, turning from King. And the, old, the previous picture was taken behind me uh, on to fourth en route to the Metro East car house, uh, where some of these cars have been stored. Uh, soon, the tracks on 4th Street, coming here off the right, will go straight across. And the T line, which now turns this way, just like the Cincinnati car shown here, will go straight across and into a new subway called the Central Subway. The tracks on this side have already been built, although they weren't when I took these pictures. Uh, so uh, they will, special work will have to be built so they cross the uh, cars going into the Fourth and King Terminal. And of course the Central Subway has to be complete, or I should say completed. Here's a photo at the uh, Metro East facility is showing cars painted in Newark, Detroit, and um, the Los Angeles Railway. So I was wrong. The Los Angeles Railway uh, color scheme is being shown in the show. Now back to the ferry building to go out the F line of along Market Street. Here are both of the, the Blackpool boats, 228 and 233, built in 1934 for that popular seaside resort on the Irish Sea. One of these cars actually ran in Philadelphia for the bicentennial. The Blackpool line itself has been converted to light rail standards and very much like the Muni line down to Fourth and King contains both light rail, runs both light rail vehicles and heritage cars intermingled on the same track. There are precedents for everything. Now the F doesn't go straight out Market Street from Embarcadero, but it goes a block further and uh, it turns onto Don Chi Way from Embarcadero. 
This is a newer car painted in the Cleveland color scheme, making the turn from Fisherman's Wharf on the Embarcadero to Market Street. And from the other direction where layovers are kept and short turn cars are kept, this is a uh, a PCC single-ended painted in the Pacific Electric color scheme turning left onto Don Chi. Uh, now, I understand that this color scheme is going to be applied to a torpedo, which will be much more like the double-ended PCCs that Pacific Electric operated. But here it's still running uh, as a single-ended car. Here's a side view of Muni Car 1, and this is looking exactly towards Market Street. So that area behind the car is a big pedestrian park instead of having the streetcar tracks running right down it like it, they used to do in the old days. So number one is going past Market Street and is heading for Don Chi Way. Number 1050 is a Philadelphia car honoring St. Louis. Now, St. Muni actually had a bunch of St. Louis PCC cars. And they still have them, but they have not been refurbished. And there's no funds for that yet. But I expect one of these days, this car will have another color scheme and an actual St. Louis car in St. Louis colors will be running here and that will be added to the list of authentic cars. On the left is the uh, Market Street Railway Museum where you can buy books, postcards, DVDs, souvenirs. It's really worth a visit and I think many of you have probably seen the Market Street Railway calendar that comes out every year. Another view of the same place where 1074, a Philadelphia Toronto car is turning from Stewart on to Don Chi. And you have the back view of, the Pits of a car that's painted in the Pittsburgh color scheme, which looks an awful, like, an awful lot like the St. Louis color scheme. Now here, this car is going from Don Chi Way onto Stewart Street in the other direction. Number 579, Gen 578 generally just runs from the ferry building out to Pier 39. So it is looping here via Stewart and Mission Streets uh, to lay over and then uh, start its journey in the opposite direction. So not too many cars run this way but a few do, generally short turns and layovers. Now we're gonna go out Market Street. Here's the old 1055 in front of the Hyatt Hotel. Now there used to be four tracks on Market Street. Uh, two pairs for Muni and another pair for the Market Street Railway. As I said before, they merged in 1944 and uh, two of the tracks were torn up in 1947 as lines started to be converted to trolleybus. Muni 1051 is in the simplified Muni color scheme. Had that been a Muni car rather than a Philadelphia car, then we'd say that one was authentic. Here we're at 3rd and Kearney in the financial district. A little further up Market Street is number 1060, a Philadelphia car in a Philadelphia car color scheme. Their original cream cheese color scheme from 1938 from uh, PRT, the Philadelphia Rapid Transit Company. This was never used on these 2100 and 2700 series all electric cars. So while we're honoring that color scheme, it is not actually authentic. 
a lot of skyscrapers in the background. And this is at Powell and Market, the turntable is off to the left of this picture. Going further out, number 1015, the Illinois Terminal Torpedo is at Market and Taylor. And as I mentioned before, they used to run to Granite City, Illinois from St. Louis. Further on at Van Ness is 1010. We saw that torpedo before. And Van Ness was sort of the line uh, from the 1906 earthquake. Everything beyond, behind that streetcar or most everything was destroyed and everything in the direction of the streetcar is running, uh, basically stayed after 1906. I believe there are some plans for short turning cars right around here on one of the streets that market intersects so that they don't have to run the F cars all the way out to 17th and Castro. Uh, but I don't know when that will be uh, completed. Here's the Philadelphia cream cheese car east of Church Street at the iconic Safeway. Always a good spot to grab a snack when rail fans get hungry or thirsty after their hard work. I like this part of Market Street because of the palm trees. At Church Street, the J light rail line crosses. And here's a picture of one of the Milan cars and the track in the foreground is the, is the track on Church Street crossing Market. There's a track that runs from Church this way onto Market for cars that are pull outs. And the cars that are pull ins that have to go up the J line uh, they have to go over a more uh, divergent uh, routing. Here we're at 15th and Market where Sanchez also crosses. And right up the street uh, was, is Beck's Motor Lodge where we stayed on our last trip, which was September, 2019 to San Francisco. And uh, this is from uh, an upper walkway on the three-story, uh, the building. And of course, that's the Los Angeles Transit Line, National City Lines, uh, fruit salad color scheme. The Castro area through here is getting pretty gentrified. And there are plenty of restaurants for us to eat, both breakfast and dinner at. It was a very good place to stay. And we needed a car because we were going up to Marin County to see my first cousin who lives there in an area that's not served by transit. And so the motor lodge, which had free parking, was a good, good location. So we'll uh, now honor Brooklyn, New York with car 1053, a Philadelphia car at 17th and no, approaching the end of the line at Castro. Now a view of a torpedo at the pullout from Geneva Car House. And uh, it's rooted via the J, as I said before. Here it's uh, on uh, 30th Street with San Jose on the background. The car will have turned from San Jose left on to 30th. At 30th and Church behind me, that was the former terminal of the J line before it was extended all the way to the car house. And our last view of San Francisco is the 10, to 10 torpedo uh, turning from 30, 30th Street, uh, from uh, San Jose onto 30th, also a pullout. Now we'll move down to 
a city that probably really does not have modern streetcars uh, in any way, shape, or form. But if you consider a PCC modern, they do have, oh, lastly, uh, I've got to show another Brooklyn shot before we leave. Uh, here in San Francisco is a newer car honoring San Diego. And that's where we're going to go next. So this is a Minneapolis newer car run by Muni uh, uh, at the uh, Jones Street Terminal at the end in Fisherman's Wharf. And here is virtually an identical car, a Minneapolis newer car painted in San Diego colors running on the silver line in San Diego. So they do look a bit different. You can see the number, the 530 here, and the number on this car is up above the windshield. And here the roof is painted in sort of a brownish gray, and there it is in red. But in reality, they're the same cars. And uh, what can I say? This is a Heritage Streetcar line, and I wouldn't call it a modern operation as it operates over existing, existing San Diego trolley track for 2.7 miles, only on a part-time basis. It started on August 27th, 2011, which actually was the date of my 50th wedding anniversary. It has nine stops, loops around, and takes 20 minutes to make that loop. 529, this is one of the St. Louis public service cars that has been painted into San Diego colors. And a similar cars like this ran in San, San Francisco and are still on the property. And hopefully, as I mentioned before, will be running in San Francisco. So if you want to ride a St. Louis public service car, you have to go to San Diego. This is at the car house and shop. And it was very nice. They were running 5.30 on the day I was there. Actually, I tried to ride it on three different days. The first two times in different years, the operation was not running because of mechanical problems. And then uh, at least the third time was a charm. And the motorman on the 5.30, when he got to 12th and Imperial, uh, stopped the car, uh, walked over to the car house, used his keys to open a locked door and let me get this photo. So it was very nice of him. He had indicated that he was born in Mexico City. And when I showed him some pictures of Mexico City uh, PCCs on my smartphone from the internet, he said he's too young to have ever seen them. Anyway, here's another view a 530, the newer car, running near the car house, which is on the right, and running along the light rail line uh, that runs uh, to 12th and, and Imperial. I think it's the green line that ends here. Now we move on to Tucson. And here we see some views that are similar to what Andrew Grahl showed last month. But this is a uh, modern streetcar, in my opinion, uh, operated by SunTram called SunLink uh, using uh, the Czech type cars. Here's a, a map and we're gonna go around uh, following the line from West Tucson up through the University of Arizona campus to its turn, terminal up here. It replaced a museum operation called Old Pueblo Trolley, which only ran for a mile and ran from 1993 to 2011. And it operated an ex-Kyoto car and an ex-Brussels unit. Uh, but here, they're now running eight United streetcars uh, 70% low four units. So here is the 
West Tucson end, all of the cars seem to have advertising wraps. Uh, this is Linda Avenue terminal. And uh, I should say the Congress Street terminal. And that was a picture of the rear of a car. This is Linda Avenue. And you can see the area is pretty barren. Uh, the neighborhood is ripe for development. And I am told that uh, the developer partly paid for the institution of the streetcar. So at some point, uh, this area will probably end up with condominiums and single family dwelling units. The Tucson Monument Mo Mountains are in the background. Here's another view of that same area along Cushing Street, which the cars follow to go onto the Luis Gutierrez Bridge over the Santa Cruz River, which at some time, sometimes during the year, or mainly mostly during the year, is just a dry gulch, but it has been known to flood. The bridge was built in conjunction with the uh, streetcar line and there's public art throughout. And notice the energy saving solar powered light, lights. It's said that when the sun is right, shadows are interesting from an art point of view, although I did not notice that. Here now we're heading into downtown. This is the junction of Granada Avenue, Congress Street and Broadway Boulevard. And um, number 105 is heading towards the bridge and out to West Tucson. Regarding Broadway Boulevard, it's paired with Congress Street uh, as two one-way operations for the car line, just like we saw in Milwaukee uh, and on the east side of Portland. The big building is one South Church, but it's not a place of worship. It's just the address of Tucson's tallest building on Church Avenue. This is on the Paired Street, Congress Street, and there's a little park where they separate and a pedestrian overpass. The pantograph is really pinched as number 102 dips, dipped under the Union Pacific tracks, which were formerly Southern Pacific. Uh, that's very close to the Amtrak station and it's separate, the tracks separate downtown from the University of Arizona district. Lots of interest in this view, looking north on 4th Avenue at 8th Street in the University District. Double track in the foreground becomes single and it heads to the car barn and shop. Uh, it passes the headquarters of the old Pueblo trolley, but no longer existing a track connection. Uh, the museum line, instead of turning This way, it would turn it turned this way out uh, back in the days that it, it operated. The landmark Tiki Head guards the patio of the Hut nightclub. And originally it comes from a tunnel on a miniature golf course. And basically uh, the community raised $20,000 to move it and refurbish it. So uh, with the streetcar now, modern streetcar in operation, there are no, there's nowhere for the old Pueblo, Pueblo trolley to run its cars. Uh, this is Brussels 1511, built in 1936 on the property near the previous picture and not in operation behind a fence. And another photo of uh, an ex-Lisbon Brill car built locally by Karras in Lisbon in 1924. This was a 900 millimeter gauge. It's uh, been converted to standard gauge and painted up to resemble Prescott and Mount Vernon 
uh, railways car number one. And I hope someday to see it in operation. Be very nice uh, if they could run a uh, heritage service on the modern streetcar line in Tucson. This is from the Second Street Garage in the university area at Mountain Avenue on the campus. And here we have New York in Tucson. Brooklyn Pizza Company wrap on the uh, light on the streetcar and in the background, the Oive Cafe in front of the Hillel Foundation. What could be more New York? And there are a lot of New Yorkers that uh, have ended up at the University of Arizona. After leaving the campus, it finally, after a couple of turns, it turns north onto single track private right of way parallel to Warren Avenue and tunnels under a major arterial Speedway Avenue. The sidewalk is at the left and you see a fence there, but as you go downhill, the fence disappears and you're walking just along the tracks at grade. And this view after the tunnel shows a staircase coming down from Warren Avenue and people cross the, the tracks uh, looking out to make sure no streetcar is coming and then make a left turn and here you can see where the side where it goes downhill into the tunnel. Finally, uh, well, two more pictures. Uh, the line turns east on Helen Avenue right to its end. And yes, the nickname of uh, University of Arizona sport team is the Wildcats. And the final end of the line terminal. It's very nice and I understand it's doing very well as far as patronage is concerned. On to El Paso, which you've heard a lot about from Carl Jackson and Andrew Grohl. The question that some people might ask, is this a modern streetcar? The industry might say no, but a lot has been done to the PCCs that run on this line. We're going to look at just this, this part of, of the operation uh, to make things shorter. El Paso is a border city separated from Ciudad Juarez by the Rio Grande River and streetcars cross the border. And I wrote some of the same PCCs car that have been restored and rebuilt during the 1960s and early 70s. Mm -hmm. 20 PCCs were built by St. Louis for San Diego in 1937, the year that I was born. And with the closure of that system, El Paso City Lines, a National City Line subsidiary, it got them in 1950 and ran them until 1974. The line is 4.8 miles long and has 27 stops running on a figure eight, or you might say an infinity figure alignment, clockwise through downtown and counterclockwise uptown with San, the San Jacinto stop hosting cars going both ways on a single track. Passengers must depend on the car's roll sign and the operator to make sure they are boarding the right car that it won't turn right to downtown rather than going up to the left to uptown. Eight cars were retained by Sun Metro, today's operator, with six having been restored and rebuilt by Brookville into three authentic color schemes for El Paso. Note the roof of the Brookville car because basically what was done was air conditioning and pantographs were added. Uh, in addition, um, wheelchair lifts and uh, some comfortable original style leather seats. In fact, when I rode these, you could just, sm they smelled just like new automobiles. 
So this was on Franklin Avenue coming from downtown and roll sign marked for Glory Road. And it's in the last 1970s livery. Southwest University Park in the background is the home of the El Paso Chihuahuas, the baseball team in the minor leagues. And the track on the right is coming in from uptown on Oregon Street. Further down on Franklin, San Jacinto Plaza, uh, that station at Mesa Street Crossing. That's the middle color scheme. El Paso City Lines was a National City Line property and the livery matches the scheme used by NCL in Los Angeles at the end. Um, and as I said before, this is a stop where you uh, have to be sure you're on the right car because cars in both directions stop at the same place. And here is the National City Lines fruit salad colors that it was also used in LA. This car is turning downtown from Franklin onto Kansas Street. And here's a side view on Stanton Street of an outbound car on the Uptown Loop. Stanton is somewhat hilly and this is looking towards Kirby. You can tell how hilly it is with this telephoto shot as Stanton approaches university and university's name for the University of Texas at El Paso. Um, I think previously I remember it is Texas Mines College and then Texas Western College. And here at the top of the Uptown Loop, approaching Mesa with the Franklin Mountains in the background, they go to a height of about 7,000 feet. And now we'll head back downtown on Oregon Street. Now, I don't know what this circular building is. I tried to figure it out from the internet. It's towards the University UTEP property, but uh, it looks, it appears to have been abandoned at this time. Um, perhaps Carl Jackson can answer that. Um, these are sort of uh, university housing in an area called Miners Village, and generally they're populated by UTEP uh, personnel and students. Also along Oregon Street, Here we have the Garden Inn, a big gen traffic generator, and further down, Las Palmas Medical Center, the view from the Schuster stop. And finally, back right before Franklin Street, where I boarded the car originally, the Double Tree Hotel and other hotels are off to the left, and the district is called the Ars District. Uh, Museum of History, the Art Museum, and a Holocaust Museum uh, are also in this location. So Claire had plenty to do while I was out riding and photographing. Now we move on to Oklahoma City, where Andrew also showed some views of modern street cars as per the industry definition. 4.8 miles long, 22 stops, opened on December 14, 2018. Two routes, basically the uh, red Midtown Loop through here and the blue Bricktown Loop. A Bricktown runs only on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays because that is the city's entertainment district with hotels, restaurants, and a ballpark. Uh, the system is quite successful. It started up without regular operation on Sundays and after a test run where a lot of people rode, Sunday operation is now permanent. They have fair vending machines at stops uh, where you can buy a $1 ticket or 50 cents for seniors or a $3 day pass. Plenty of inspect I got inspected a number of times so make sure you have a ticket, but it's quite cheap.
These are Brookville Liberty cars, just like Detroit, and you will see later Dallas, but they're in three different color schemes, three of which are red, two blue, and two green. Embark, which you see on the side of the car, is the name of the agency which runs all of the transit in Oklahoma City, and they have contracted with Herzog for the operation of the line. You can see the number 201802, the first four digits of the year, which is very much like a European practice, and the last two are the consecutive numbers for the seven cars. There are, there are three sections, 67 foot long, double-ended, with 70% low floor. 66% of the route, or two-thirds, is wireless because of under railroad overpasses and other reasons which I can't quite determine. Uh, here's a car leaving downtown at Hudson and Forth where you, the car changes from overhead or from wireless to overhead. And this car is inbound uh, towards downtown. This is a very close stop to the Oklahoma City National Memorial Museum, where Timothy McVeigh blew up and bombing the federal building back in 1995. Now it's one of Oklahoma City's major tour and tourist attractions. Here's the Northern Terminal, Dewey Avenue between 10th and 11th in the Midtown section of Oklahoma City. This is near the Midtown stop, 10th and Hudson. You can photograph from this park. On Robinson Avenue, heading back towards downtown, this is St. Paul's Episcopal Church. And further down Robinson is the First Church United Methodist. A lot of churches in Oklahoma. But also modern office buildings. This is the Bach Tower, Bank of Oklahoma, 27 stories on Sheridan. Notice this is a wireless area, so there's no view disrupted. But then when you go a little further, you've got the Devon Energy Center, the tallest building in Oklahoma City at 50 floors on the same street, but that has wire. So, you know, I haven't figured it out, but I'm sure they knew what they were doing. You have the same parking problem that I mentioned in Washington, D.C., indicated here in Oklahoma City, which, if you can't read it, it says, do not block streetcar, park inside the line, or be towed. Further east on Sheridan, the line runs under the Burlington Northern Santa Fe and Amtrak, and here it has to be wireless. So you've got wireless far out on Sheridan, then you've got wire before the underpass, and then it becomes wire again after the underpass. And then actually, uh, it continues that way. Here on the south side of the loop that you saw on the map, map is the Cox Convention Center, uh, home of the Chesapeake Energy Arena, where the Oklahoma City Thunder NBA play basketball. So this is the stop on Reno Avenue for the arena. Santa Fe hub stop right near the Amtrak station and just before the underpass. So here, the this car has already lowered its pantograph from the wire because it needs to do that to go and make it through the underpass. Chickasaw Bricktown Ballpark is further east on Reno, but Reno at this point has been renamed Johnny Bench Drive, this brief section. Uh, opposite side on this Bricktown loop is the Mickey Mantle Station and home of Mickey Mantle Steakhouse. But if you think the new, this is New York Yankee territory because of Mickey Mantle, note that the park is home to the Oklahoma City Dodgers, and it has Dodger blue throughout. 
And we finish Oklahoma City with uh, another tourist attraction, the canal boat ride in the heart of Bricktown. You notice the B-R-I-C-K at the right. And uh, our hotel was in the back of that, a Hampton Inn. Now we move on to Dallas. This is a Dallas streetcar, a modern streetcar, partly wireless like Oklahoma City and with the same type of Brookville Liberty cars. It opened in 2015, was extended a bit in 2016. It's four cars, six stops, and runs a 20 minute headway. This is Union Station where it starts in the background. You can see wire there. This is where they charge the motors sometimes if they need charging, but the wire is there not for the track that goes in the left foreground out the Houston Street Viaduct, but the track that goes off to the right that heads down to the car house and shop, which is saved, shared with the DART light rail transit system. And the track on the right, uh, uh, that turns off to the right, uh, is downhill to go down to the level of the LRT line. So you see the wire here, but it's wireless across the bridge for aesthetic reasons. And the bridge crosses the Trinity River and it, it is single track. Here's another view, same bridge with the Dallas skyline in the background and a similar view from Jefferson Jefferson Boulevard viaduct uh, from, and that viaduct serves motor traffic going into Dallas while this bridge serves streetcars. Uh, this is the conversion spot from wireless to overhead at the uh, Greenbrier stop, also taken from the Jefferson Viaduct, which comes down onto Zang Boulevard, which is what you see in this photo. Again, 70% uh, low floor Brookville cars. Oak Cliff Station right here with the crossover was the original terminal at Colorado Boulevard in Beckley and all cars use the track that this car is shown on. Now, of course, inbound cars go on, run via the other track. This is on North Beckley, and you can see it's quite residential here. So you, it, you've got the double track line running through a residential neighborhood, which I find attractive. And finally, the Bishop Arts Terminal in the Arts District that has boutiques, restaurants, bars, art galleries, and so on. There's another streetcar operation in Dallas, which came first in 1989. And that's the McKinney Avenue line, which is shown in this map. And this map shows what it looks like today. I can't call it a modern streetcar system, but now after it was built as a heritage line, it has some modern features. Basically, it was run, it was supported by the businesses in the areas and the rail fans and operated as McKinney Avenue Transit Authority. And it got very popular and finally uh, DART, the transit agency took it over and is subsidizing it. Uh, and now there's a free fare. Uh, the idea came from the discovery of trackage along McKinney Avenue after it, it was scape, scraped for repaving. Instead of uh, scraping the tracks, they started the line with the old legacy trackage. The system, the, DART, the uh, Dallas Railway and Terminal Company was abandoned in 1956. So now, with several extension, it is 4.6 miles long. Uh, first to City Place, which uh, has the DART light rail line underground 
and that was done in 2002. And there's a turntable there now. And then it was converted to a downtown loop in 2015. And that is what allows the operation of single ended cars now. So if you go back to the map, notice that DART is on both ends. Oops, I'm pointing with my finger. Shouldn't do that. I should use the cursor wherever it is. Here, DART light rail comes here on the surface on this end and comes out to city place underground at the other end of the line. And the cars go into this street, City Place West, turn on a turntable, then come back out and follow the loop this way. Seventy one sixty nine is another ex Brussels car. This is a PCC like the one we saw in San Francisco. And it's in the shop of the McKinney Avenue Transit Authority. It was this car was built in 1970 with by St. Uh, with Johnstown Traction uh, PCCs, electrical equipment and trucks. So the, uh, the trucks and electrical equipment come from St. Louis car via Johnstown and everything else, the bodies were built by Le Bourgeois. Uh, left side doors were installed uh, in Dallas and each of the cars on McKinney Avenue has a name and this one is named Emma and I don't know why. I don't know who the M is. 4614 is an ex Toronto PCC. And interestingly enough, it is named Margaret, which is after the matriarch of the Trammell Crow family, the, shoot, the big real estate developers in Dallas. But I'd like to think since the Toronto car, it's named Margaret after Margaret Bromley the widow of John Bromley, a former ERA member and major historian and photograph of the Toronto Transit uh, Commission. So I'll call this the Margaret Bromley car. And left side doors were also added to this one, as you can see in this photo on Cole Avenue, the previous photo being on Cole on um, City Place West. Now, this is definitely not a modern system, but it's wonderful. So I couldn't resist showing it. This is New Orleans, of course. And now it has some modern aspects. Uh, so we'll call this another detour and diversion. Five lines, five foot, two and a half inch gauge. Not so long ago, it was down to only one, the historic St. Charles. And why are there now more tourism, redevelopment, environmental reasons? Any and all of them. Here is St. Charles Avenue in the Garden District at the four, at Fourth Avenue crossing. Uh, the car, which is a Pearly Thomas unit from 1924 with a little modernization, uh, is on the neutral ground. And back when I first visited New Orleans in the early 1960s, this was beautiful green. But what happened after that was the jogging craze. So all that grass that used to be there is long gone and uh, the joggers like it. And I guess it does make for a uh, more pleasant community. Here is a riverfront, which is called Route 2 now. They've numbered the routes. Uh, St. Charles Avenue is Route 12. And this is a pullout running on canal uh, from the, the new car house uh, down uh, to the riverfront. And it's at Barone Dauphin, Dauphin, 
Uh, that's what crosses the street. Some the streets change their names when they cross Canal Street. The bodies match the Pearly Thomas units, and they were built uh, at the Carrollton shop. But they have CKD Tatra PCC trucks. They're numbered 457 to 463. What's new about them is that two of these now have been painted green and uh, with their wheelchair lifts installed, uh, they have begun operating on the St. Charles line. One of them is number 462. I don't know what the other number is of the two riverfront cars that are now green and on St. Charles. This is Canal Street at the junction of the 47 and 48 Canal Street routes and the 49 new route called Loyola Rampart. Cars 2001 to 24 were built in the RTA Carrollton shops by the late Elmer Von Dullen with Brookville suppl supplied propulsion equipment and trucks. Uh, the, the deck roof is supposed to hide the air conditioning equipment but it sort of makes them look odd, in my opinion. Uh, the original St. Carl's St. Whoops Canal line was abandoned in 1964, and it was restored in 2004. So 40 years of no streetcars on Canal, and then finally they came back with air conditioning and wheelchair lifts. And here's a view on the neutral ground further up showing the wheelchair lifts. So what's the most modern here, thing here? The neutral ground or the streetcars or the streetcar lifts? Good question. Now we move on to Atlanta and their downtown loop streetcar inaugurated December 30th, 2014. It's a two and three quarter mile counterclockwise 12 stop loop, a 15 minute headway, but people can walk pretty much between stops rather than wait 15 minutes. So it has been known to have low patronage, patronage, but it definitely has spurred renovation, renewal and redevelopment. It was started independently, but has now been taken over by MARTA, the agency, and they plan to move ahead with extensions to the line, which may increase and probably will increase patronage. For ultra short Siemens S70s uh, run on the line. This is the first view in this show of the Siemens S70 cars that have been uh, compact and slowed down for streetcar operation. They are also run in Salt Lake City, but we skipped Salt Lake City. And so here we are at the Woodruff Park stop, stop where the loop is sort of close together. Uh, it's very near the heart of downtown, uh, near the iconic Five Points uh, and the Peachtree Center. Here's the one crossover on the line. And I was quite lucky to get the two cars together here. Here it's inbound on Edgemont at Piedmont. Uh, you can see towards downtown and Georgia State University in the background. This is located between Sweet Auburn Market and the Hurt Park stop. And lastly, one other picture of the Atlanta Modern Streetcar. Again, a 70% low floor Siemens car is at the Park Place stop and uh, this car is heading toward Woodruff Park, which you saw in the first slide. On to the Charlotte Trolley, or as it's called nowadays, the Lynx Gold Line. This was built as a heritage line, but is now going to be a modern streetcar. Uh, this building is now a community center and it has inside it a former Connecticut company streetcar. It started with Herit a heritage car 
car number 85 from the Duke Power Company running off over the Norfolk Southern uh, with a rolling generator from the south end to downtown. It was later electrified at 650 volts DC and operated from 1996 to 2006 th with three Gomaco built Bernie replicas, numbers 91 to 93, which came in 2004. It then closed down for construction of the Lynx Blue Line, the light rail transit route, which then reopened with the Gomacos in the year 2008. And the Blue Line and the Gomacos ran together and shared tracks through this south end area and into downtown, which by the way is called Uptown in Charlotte from 2008 to 2010. So here you're going to have a situation of the same kind of technology, one called light rail and one called heritage streetcar, sharing the tracks, running under the same wire. After it was closed, the city decided to build a streetcar line perpendicular to the uh, Lynx Blue Line LRT in downtown. Here you see the skyline from the east-west station uh, of Charlotte, where the two lines, the two operations ran together. So these cars then, when it reopened as a east-west line in, uh, what year was that? In 2015. And it, it's going to be a long line, but this was the first one and a half miles, six stops that opened on July 14th, 2015, running cross town from the arena stop on the light rail line to Presbyterian Hospital. It's in the process of being extended a further two and a half miles. So it will be four miles with 17 stops and new Siemens S700 cars, similar to the S70s that you saw uh, in the previous shots running on the Charlotte light rail uh, and running in Atlanta, but they'll be 85 feet long and this line will be equipped with them. But here it is at Elizabeth and Torrance. Note the warning signs for bicyclists. You think they'd know. But I guess when you go and start a new thing in a town that didn't have streetcars for a very long time, you've got to put up the warning. Here is Central Piedmont Community College, one of several traffic generators on the line. Central High School is at the stop, uh, has a very nice clock tower, and you can see it a pretty much new uh, school of higher learning. Now we go along the street and we find a monument to Harry Golden, who was a journalist and author and wrote only in America, uh, which I have in my library. It's, uh, he was a great fighter against segregation and Jim Crow and worked right along uh, this street. From the parking deck of the Mecklenburg County Jail, you can see I-277 in the background and the Gold Line Lynx car running toward downtown. On the other side of I-277, here's a view where a car going towards the hospital but with the skyline in the background. And when I said downtown, I meant uptown. Here is the Charlotte Transit Center terminal, uh, which will become the midpoint of the line when it is extended. And hopefully that will be done before the end of 2021. Uh, the platform shelter here is decorated 
uh, with railroad and streetcar artifacts, both newspaper articles, timetables, photos, and the like. And the shelter that's on both sides of the tracks that's set up that way. And here's the transit center terminal. And I'm photographing this from the bus terminal with the blue line uh, elevated arena CTC station. And so if you shoot a picture this way, you got to shoot it the other way. And this is from the uh, blue line station of the uh, Harris's streetcar line, soon to become modern. A little bit further north on the blue line, you can see here the connecting track because the gold line uh, Gomaco cars are kept in the same car house in the south end of the, of the blue line as our blue line cars. And that's how they get there. The last time I was here was on that motor trip in 2019, and I did not get great weather, but I wanted to say farewell to these cars because it was just a week or two before the line was shut down for reconstruction. And this, of course, is the terminal right next to the blue line. And here is the hospital terminal at Fifth and Hawthorne. And here's a photo I took on the that day, and uh, I was uh, with Bruce Benty at the time. I don't know if he's in the audience right now, but I'm sure he remembers being rained upon. And here is a photo of the line being extended in that direction, being extended in both directions. And hopefully we'll be able to ride in 2021. So how much more modern will the streetcar be when it goes back into service this year. And that's the end of my modern streetcar portion. And let me look at my watch, it's after 10. So I don't think I'm going to be able to show uh, a section on Luxembourg, but I'll try. And I won't mind if any of you leave. Uh, it's go a ahead, very Jack. Go, go, ahead. go ahead, Jack, you still have 116 people. They can always drop off. Okay, very good. We will do that. And I have to switch to another part of Bob, while it's Randy, while he's doing yeah. it, why don't you read, uh, read from that Emma thing? I'm sorry? Um, I sent uh, Jack and you a picture of the car card inside that Emma car in um, McKinney uh -huh. Avenue. And what does Emma say? All right, all right, hang on. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I didn't, yeah, go ahead, Randy. All right, hang on one second. I made it a little bit too big for myself. Give me a moment here to reduce it. Oops. I had an Aunt Emma, but I'm sure it's not. Uh, celebrating her. Uh, okay, I right, hear it says for hello, or perhaps I should say bonjour. I was built blah 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 blah, written sure. 1970, just like you said, and nonetheless uh, talks about. Um, I'm sorry, I was named after uh, the Mata chief dispatcher Arthur Torres's daughter Emma, who was delivered at about the same time that I was, meaning the, the trolley car arriving back in Dallas. Gotcha. That's no wonder I no wonder I didn't know. <laughs> well, you had to ride the car to see it, and I have to tell you, when I went, I was there earlier. In yeah, but it's something I wouldn't remember. Well, I was there earlier in 2020, and they couldn't have been nicer when I went in the show. Oh, they're wonderful people. Yes, yeah. and I I did duplicated most of your trip. Um, and earlier. maybe you saw John Landrum there, okay. who basically. Uh, was a driving factor in creating that whole thing, which is extremely successful. Right, did a wonderful job. Thank you. So I'm showing a short piece on Luxembourg, which is one of the smallest countries in Europe, and bordering on uh, Germany, France, and Belgium. And basically, it's because that in the uh, it was a news item in the rail news and review portion of the January ERA bulletin that mentioned that this line was extended. Uh, this was a uh, poster uh, that was on the, 
posted along the lines at various stations announcing the first extension to the line, uh, which I got to uh, less than a week after it opened. It's called Lux Tram. It's now four and a quarter miles long. The first section was just overhead, and this is a modern tram. Instead of calling it a modern streetcar, it's a modern tram because that's what the Europeans call them. Whether they're light rail or street running, they still call them trams. And it ran, opened with just overhead on December 10th, 19, 2017, as a two mile long, 750 volts DC. Then on, seven, on July 27th, 2018, it was extended one mile wireless and now runs to the Central Railway Station for another one and a quarter miles, uh, opened less than a month ago. So uh, they like their stylish posters. Uh, this was another one that was up more recently and uh, it obviously is for safety purposes. Uh, going back to the original one, it indicates that the line on, a, I'm sorry, I did not. Uh, yeah, can you make it full screen? Yeah, I'm sorry, I forgot to do that. So here it is. Ooh, okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, and you can see it was open July 27th. And they were running a free fare, which I thought was absolutely wonderful. I didn't have to pay a fare. But since then, they decided to institute free fares for transit throughout the whole country. So now everyone does not pay whether they ride a bus, a tram, or a commuter rail train. So the posters are stylish and the rolling stock is stylish also. These are, uh, they have 21 of these CAF Urbos 3, Urbo 3 cars, very Ooh. similar to what's running in Cincinnati and Kansas City, but with a different front and much more stylish. 12 more are on order for future extensions of the line to the airport. Note the angular front end and how stylized the headlights, taillights are. They use the same lights, white going forward, red go on the back end. From a article on the company's website, trains present a luminous color inside. Now it's very hard for me to show that. Uh, you can see it a little bit of purple on this view. So this is also part of the stylish version of Luxtram. And here's another photo, this one from the website uh, taken by the company that shows uh, yellow or orange as the color in, in one of the sections. Each of the sections have a different color working their way from purple, blue, down to uh, yellow orange at the other end. This is the Lux Expo terminal uh, with a very graceful canopy. And the cars lay up behind uh, this car where you see the automobile. In other words, they have to cross the street to lay up to come in on the track on the right. Uh, but crossing the street for a streetcar oh. is not a problem. They do it all over the world. Uh, there are many traffic ge generators along John F. Kennedy Avenue, John F. Kennedy, as Luxembourg hosts several European de Union departments. Uh, this is the Philharmonie Mudam stop uh, where they have a concert hall and a modern art museum. Note, the, this is the overhead initial section. We go a little further down and we get to the Coke uh, 
C-O-Q-U-E, not K-O-C-H, uh, also along JFK. And this is uh, on the left, an entertainment complex, an indoor sports arena with all kinds of ice skating and other items for the public. Just beyond the route wreck Offendahl stop, the wireless portion begins. And that behind me was the inner initial interterminal. So here there's a crossover that was used when the line first opened. And the line here crosses a bridge uh, toward downtown. At this station is a funicular, in fact, a double funicular, one on each side, uh, built by Doppelmayr cable operation at a 19.7% grade that runs down to the Kirchberg Pfaffenthal station, which is actually a suburban station because it's not the main st station of uh, Luxembourg City, uh, but it has above the tracks here where the funicular comes in, it has all the amenities of any major downtown terminal in, in Europe, or for that matter, uh, like Grand Central in the US. And yet it's just a suburban station. Uh, and you ride escalators uh, or elevators down to the platform level. This is a Alstom uh, built EMU from the 1990s running uh, under 25,000 volts. And it can only run in Luxembourg or France. Here's a map that shows everything much better. Here is the railroad line and the Pfaffenthal Kirchberg station, the route Breck Pfaffenthal station of the light rail line. With this extension, you can now ride the light rail line, which had ended here when I visited all the way down to central station. Or you can do as what I did, change for the train and ride the train down to central station. Eventually, the right li rail line will be extended on this end to the airport, which is near the motel where I stayed, and on the other end as well. The lines, this line basically stays in Luxembourg. It's all 25 kV. This line going out here, while it's 25 kV in Luxembourg, it continues into Belgium, where it goes down to 3,000 volts DC. And this line here that goes out this way, and this line here go into France, where it's 25,000 volts. This line here goes to Germany, where it's 15,000 volts. All of the trains that come through here are international. so a lot of the rolling stock is tri-voltage. Here's a view from the ride to Central Station of the Old Town from the train that I was in. And you can see it's a beautiful city. It's uh, been assigned World Heritage Status by UNESCO. Look at all the steeples. Now, when you walk through the Old Town, you can come to a spot where you can photograph the train viaduct, the one that I had wrote, ridden to Central Station, and you can see what operates here. And this is one of the tri-voltage double-deck MU cars. 25 kV, 50 hertz for France, 3,000 volts DC for Belgium, and 15 kV, 16 and two-thirds cycle for Germany. Beautiful city. Richard Horn sent me these slides of leg legacy cars 
uh, at the Luxembourg Tram Museum. The legacy system quit in 1964, and these cars were built in 1926. So like many cities in the US, Luxembourg abandoned their streetcar system and later brought back tramways or light rail or streetcars. And here's another view of the legacy system. If you're on tonight, thank you, Richard Horn. Continuing uh, down on the wireless section, uh, we are between uh, And I don't know how to pronounce that very well. Fionieri and Star Staroplatz, Place de Etoile station, where the line runs in a beautiful green carpet. And that is very, very nice. And it really looks charming. And a little further, when you get to Staroplatz, uh, only one side or one track has the green carpet and the rest is, is paved. Now it continues from behind me to Central Station and I hope someday to get back to photograph that portion. One last photo of Luxembourg back at the Fionnesseri station and it's right before the deluge. Just escaped getting soaked. The green section of track is behind me and it started pouring rain right after I took that photo, but luckily there was a shelter for me to grab a car back out to Lux Expo. So I think we might have to stop this here. Is that, is that 1030 or so, or I could go on. Bob, tell me what to yes. do. Um, let me see. You got about a hundred three. How much longer do you have? Would you estimate? Well, it? I've got another segment that shows my life during COVID, what I did get out to do, and it's both okay. railroad and streetcar, light rail. So, <laughs> should I start? So the longest show was another twenty minutes. If you can wrap up, maybe. I won't wrap start. up, but we'll just in twenty minutes. We'll just wrap up automatically. Okay. Anyway, I live in Montclair and near full screen. Lots of light rail. I'm trying to get to full screen. I'm, I have to wait for something to go away. There we go. Okay. okay. This is the, in the spring, you probably read about my joints on the river line in the, in the bulletin. Well, I also drove a short distance into Jersey City from Montclair to cover portions of the Hudson Bergen light rail line. This is on the West Side Avenue branch at Martin Luther King Drive. And behind me is one station to the end of the line at West Side Avenue. When I got here, it was the heart of the COVID period, but I was wearing a mask and uh, the people that were riding, and there were quite a few people riding, uh, also wore masks. So I felt socially distant. This is at the Garfield Avenue. I'm sorry, this is the, uh, and you can see the people here. This is the Martin Luther King Boulevard station and plenty of riders. And this is the Garfield Avenue station from Randolph Avenue, uh, one side of the station with two cars passing each other. Um, Going back to the first view, you've got a five section car in front of a three section car. The LRVs were delivered by Kinky Shario in the three section version. And many of them, about half the fleet of this line and the Newark City subway, the cars have been extended to five sections. So you've got long cars and short cars and the platforms will not serve two long cars in a train. So that's why the two car trains are made up of a long and a short. And 
with social distancing, everything was running two cars. So here's Garfield Avenue from Randolph, and here's the opposite end of Garfield Avenue, where you get the, new, the skyline. Uh, you've got the Liberty Tower in New York City over here. And uh, I've got something written about that. Um, 94 stories, some people call it the Freedom Tower, but uh, they like to call it One World Trade Center now. And this is 79 stories, and this is on the Jersey side of the Hudson River, the Goldman Sachs building. And that's the tallest building in New Jersey, the West Side Avenue branch, as you can see, uh, runs right past it. The first car of this train is in a wrap. A little further down uh, is the Halliday Street Great Crossing. This and another one further down are the only two with gates. All the other crossings on the line have traffic signals. Uh, uh, this was uh, set up that way. I don't know exactly why, but in my opinion, uh, some of the other stop uh, great crossings should have gates as well because there's been a number of accidents on the northern part of the line where it's traffic lights and some drivers go right through them. Here we are on the main line that runs to Bayonne, uh, but this is still Jersey City from the Bayview Avenue overpass. Um, you can also see the New York skyline from here. I have in my collection of slides, this photograph with the two World Trade Center buildings back in the old days. And then of course, this photograph with neither of the World Trade Center buildings as well. And I can say that for the Garfield Avenue photos too. Anyway, the uh, car house and shop of the line is in the background here and you can see cars peeking out. Uh, this is uh, a close up with uh, Jersey City skyline in the background. New York is way off to the right. Here we go in the fall now to the northern end of the line. This is right along the Hoboken, Weehawken border. Um, and uh, the leaves are about to change. This is from an overpass. And here further along the line, along Port Imperial Boulevard, uh, between Lincoln Harbor and Port Imperial, with some of the leaves changed, another view. By now, they on the line that runs from Tonnelly Avenue in North Bergen to Hoboken, they were running one car, while on the other line from Tonnelly Avenue to West Side Avenue that you saw at the beginning of this segment, uh, they're running two car trains. This is the view from our bedroom in Montclair as the leaves were turning. Now we go on to a spot under a mile away uh, from my house where I easily walked the North Fulton Grade Crossing on New Jersey Transit's montclair Booton line. New Jersey Transit painted three different types of locomotives in heritage color schemes for predecessor railroads. This is an ALP46 electric locomotive in Pensy colors under 25 KV 60 Hertz catenary uh, through uh, Montclair on a electrification that was extended from downtown Montclair to Montclair State University uh, with the Montclair connection where we now have service directly to Penn Station in New York. When I bought the house in 1970, in my wildest imagination, I didn't expect to get a one seat ride from Watching Avenue Station about eight tenths of a mile from the house to New York. And uh, boy, was I happy. And of course, property values went up as well. 
Anyway, this is a great crossing right near the house. Here's uh, Grove Street in Montclair uh, with an Alstom PL42 AC diesel locomotive. Uh, this line was formerly the Erie Greenwood Lake Line and uh, now it's the New Jersey Transit Montclair Booton Line. Now this is on the Morris and Essex. This used to have a 3000 volt DC electrification. That was converted 25 kV, uh, just like uh, what we have in Montclair on the Booton line. Uh, and here is our Pensy ALP 46 built by Bombardier, uh, hauling a train in the town of Orange, approaching the Highland Avenue stop. So here we have these locomotives that can run 25,000 volt, 60 Hertz, but also can run 12,000 volts, 12,500 volts now it's been upped, uh, 25 cycles. And this is the North Elizabeth station on the Pensy side. So these, these locomotives have automatic change of voltage and can run up anywhere where it's electrified on the New Jersey transit system. The Arrow twos, which are MU cars shown here at the same location. Uh, oh, this is Highland Avenue, I take that back. We are still on the 25 kV electrification. Uh, here we go to North Elizabeth on the Amtrak Northeast Corridor with a train of Arrow 2 MUs. These cars are not long for the world as New Jersey Transit is going to order multi-level electric cars to replace them. So they'll still be MUs. They'll be running in three sets with one, with these two types of multi-level cars on either end. And you can make up a train up to 12 cars once they have this. So imagine these cars that you see here with a pantograph on them, and they will be the next era of New Jersey Transit and electric MU operation. Here is an ALP 46 pushing at North Elizabeth Station on the former Penn State Main Line. Same location with the Heritage Locomotive 4636. Same multi-level cars on the end. These trains run push-pull and there's a cab car at the rear, but it's not so interesting to photograph cab cars. So here we have Pensy colors on the Pensy. And of course, Amtrak Northeast Regional and Acela trains run on these tracks as well. So uh, you've got uh, a Siemens ACS 64 Sprinter locomotive at this point on a Northeast Regional train running express, of course. And the Acela cars, which also are not long for this world also run down the Northeast Corridor. Uh, and this is again at North, at North Elizabeth. And the reason they're not lo long for this world is this. This is the Acela II or the Alstom Avelia Liberty train in a test run. So these uh, trains will be replacing the Acelas that you've seen for all these years after all the testing is done. And I believe they've already been tested at the Pueblo test track of the Department of Transportation. This was odd. While I was at North Elizabeth, this GP40 diesel was pulling an ALP46 with its pans down. I don't know if it's a disabled locomotive or just an equipment move because very 
few trains of Comet uh, coaches are only four tracks long. Most four cars long. Almost all are longer than that. But I'll never find out whether this was a planned equipment move or an ALP 46 broke down somewhere. And considering the fact that they were built by Bombardier, the latter is quite possible. Now we go to the Caucus Junction for a second heritage car, a heritage locomotive. This is a GP 40H like the previous view. And this is painted for another predecessor railroad, the Jersey Central. It's pulling the Comet 5 cars. These were the last of the Comet series uh, and were built by Alstom with center doors. And I suspect that a new order of multi-level cars will not replace all of these. Anyway, the locomotives, I think, will be replaced in the near future by another type of locomotive, which you'll see in a minute. Anyway, the train is coming from Hoboken and heading into Secaucus lower level station. And that's a later Jersey Central color scheme. Same place. Number 4206, this uh, locomotive was originally New York Central, then Penn Central, of course, and finally Conrail before making its way into New Jersey Transit. And here is a Alstom built PL42AC with multi-levels heading into the lower level. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, pushing towards Hoboken. This is the other engine I was talking about. This is also a Bombardier product. This is a ALP 45 DP, meaning dual power or dual mode. And it can run as a diesel electric or as a straight electric. And can run on either the 25 kV or the 12 and a half 25 cycle. Uh, operation. They are buying more of these, even though they don't need any more for electric operation. They say that they just want to have a very small number of different parts. So they've got these dual mode engines, more of them coming on board right now, which I'm sure are much more expensive than buying straight diesels. Anyway, one of these was painted also for heritage in Erie Lackawanna color schemes. And this uh, train is being by push, pushed by an ALP 45 uh, with the panograph down, even though it's under the wire, out of Montclair Bay Street towards Hoboken. It seems they leave it up to the engineer to decide whether to have the panograph up or down. And the cost of operation of these uh, huge heavyweight locomotives is much cheaper under electric. But you never know if you're going to see them under the wire with pans up or pans down. And this is in the high level platform, Bay Street Station in Montclair, it's about a two mile walk from my house. So here we have the Erie Lackawanna Heritage. And now we go to another Erie Lackawanna locomotive. This is a transition to the Starbridge line in Honesdale, Pennsylvania, which is restoring an ex Bessemer and Lake Erie F7A to Erie Lackawanna colors. The Starbridge line is a takeoff on the Starbridge Lion, the name of a locomotive that operated there in Honesdale in as long ago as 1829. This railroad, which was a branch line of the Erie, is now a short line, the Lackawaxen and Starbridge. It runs for 25 miles and it took it over the tracks many years after Conrail spun it off. Conrail spun it off in 1976. Uh, Norfolk Southern now operates on the Erie 
line of the Lackawaxen end on its uh, Port Jervis Binghamton Rhine. And uh, this line runs for 25 miles from there to Hawley, and, pardon the expression, and Honesdale in the north po northern part of the Pocono Mountains. It runs both freight and electric and excursion passenger service since 2015. So from 1976 to 2015, there was nothing here and now it's been refurbished by its current owners. And this locomotive looks very nice. Um, the excursions were running pretty often on weekends during the COVID season. Uh, 9880 is an FP7 from Canada built in 1951 for the Canadian Pacific and later acquired by AMT for Montreal Commuter Service. It's restored to Pennsylvania Railroad Brunswick Lean Green Livery, which I am told is the favorite of the owner. And it's shown here about two miles south of the Holmesdale station. Here's the same locomotive crossing White Mills Road in the town of White Mills, right below Holmesdale. And on the rear of this train is a former Bangor and Rustak EMD built BLT locomotive, number 54. And that was the number it carried on the Bangor and Rustak. And so this locomotive pulls when the train goes back to Holmesdale. And they run excursions of various different lengths. Um, on the day that Claire and I were there, they were running about 16 miles, uh, which was a little past Hawley. And it was coming through the outskirts of Hawley. That's a nice train, uh, Pennsylvania Railroad Tuscan Red, rolling stock, but a stainless steel car in the middle, spoiling the appearance just like when the Broadway Limited in the old days had a 13 bedroom car in the midst uh, that was stainless steel from one of the Southern railroads in the midst of all the Tuscan units. So again, back at White Mills with the BL, with two uh, push, pulling instead of pushing. Now on to the Baltimore Streetcar Museum. Um, this was at, a, at the beginning of November, the Friends of Philadelphia Trolleys ran a fundraiser uh, on this five foot four and a half inch gauge line, which matches the gauge of the old Baltimore streetcar system. And the line runs for about three quarters of a mile along Falls Road and it with loops at both ends because Baltimore had a lot of single ended cars. And most of the equipment running on it is ex-Baltimore equipment. This car, C-145, a 1923 Brill sweeper that was retired in 1970, being one of the exceptions. It was lovingly restored by Matt Norn's children. And they really did a fantastic job on it. Of course, they had a little bit of help from their dad. 417 is an 1888 built single trucker operated that had operated in three different modes. It was once a horse car pulled by equines, then it became a cable car, and finally an electric car. Uh, but the beauty was it was retired back in 19, in the early 1900s. It was really a, a lovely car. And the people in this, uh, on this date had the opportunity to drive most of these cars. And we were really lucky. It was a warm day with blue sky, a side view of the 417, just a classic. Here's another good one, 554 built in 1896 by the Brownell Car Company of St. Louis. Uh, this open bench unit was retired in 1919. Uh, I love the uh, 
cow catcher fender in the front. And again, uh, it provided a great breezy ride on what was a very warm day. Here's another Philadelphia car that was regaged to run on the Baltimore uh, style trackage. This is an all electric PCC from 1948, just like what you saw in San Francisco and the PCC twos in Philadelphia and uh, other places like uh, the Transportation Museum in St. Louis. It was beautifully restored and repainted in the so-called Gulf oil livery and sponsored by the Friends of Philadelphia trolleys. Harry Donahue and Bill Monahan were here on the time and uh, they were watching carefully that there'd be no scratches put on it. I mean, it was their lab labor of love. So another view on the loop. 1948, good golf. Here's 4533 from the 1920s, a Brill single trucker. And that was didn't last long. It was retired in 1930, according to the BSM's website. Another handsome car. And this is at the uh, other end of the line. The first pictures you saw were, were at the 28th Street Loop, and, and this is getting closer to the loop at the main museum building and car house. The overpass is the CSX Railroad, which you may know that a freight train fell onto the Baltimore Streetcar Museum trackage, and it had, be, had to be closed while everything was repaired. Fortunately, the CSX, since it was their fault, paid for it. So you can see that concrete in the picture that is quite recent and came with funds from uh, CSX. Here's another view head on, on more typical trackage. That fence there um, is there because Falls Road is having a, a sewer built under it and there's a lot of construction work. In fact, the road is closed to automobiles. There are only walkers and bikers, as well as rail fans walking on Falls Road. And a side view of the 4533. We go on to Peter Witt, 6119, built in 1930 by Brill and retired in 1954. Another great restoration job. And then Air Electric PCC 7407 from Pullman Standard in 1944. This car lasted in the more familiar yellow color, scream, see, color scheme of Baltimore into right to the end of streetcar operations in 1963. Another great restoration job. And indicating that the public that was invited to uh, this fundraiser could drive. Here was the youngest member from Philadelphia driving a car with 7407 about to pass. And just a couple of combination shots through Philadelphia is together on the 28th Street Loop. Three cars together and two Baltimore cars together. It was such a nice day that I continued out to the Maryland Transportation Administration's light rail line out in Lithicum Heights. And this is at the Nursery Road Station. These are AB built, ABB ASEA Brown Bavari cars uh, built for the Baltimore Light Rail operation. Uh, 53 cars, 95 feet long, nine and a half feet wide. So they're wider than most uh, 
light rail cars, and they look quite bulky, especially when you compare them to the modern streetcars that you saw early on the show. So this is in Lisbon-Cum Heights, and here's another view of a train crossing the Patasco River. The shadows were very long by this time of the day, it was November, but uh, fortunately this is a side view, so you don't see that. I think we'll now call it a day, I, even though I prepared a few more, but I think uh, at least it's time for me to go to bed. Okay. So thank so, you so much for all of your attention. Jack, uh, unshare your screen. I want to take this opportunity right. to now, thank you. Uh, how, do, how do I unshare it? Uh, just go back to the green button and just press it again. Yeah, I got to find my way to the green button. Oh, I know. I just hit the X. Right. I, but there's so a green button. Yeah, now I have to go to here. Right. Should be a green and button. Where do I see the green button? On the bottom. You're on a PC, yeah. right? Yes, I'm on a PC and I don't. OK, you have to move the up, make this smaller. Move the cursor all the way down to the bottom of your PC and just start going along the screen. Go all the way to the bottom. OK. I think I can, I, I think I can do it. Yes, Bob, you I should be so. able to do it. Yes, okay. so I will. There we go. There you go. I took care of it. There so Jack, uh, okay. so I just left everyone a message. The next program's February 19th. If you're not a member, uh, erausa.org, please feel please free to join or, or donate. You can stay on for a few minutes. So if people can, you have a lot of compliments on the, uh, uh, on the side. Uh, people have my email, your email. You will probably get some thank you emails. And I, I see a lot on the screen. All of you can unmute yourself and turn on uh, turn on the video. We'll just stay on for a few minutes for, for a few people to congratulate you. You had now the biggest turnout, Jack, at 160 people tonight. Thank, oh. thank, thank you, Jack. I hope you all enjoyed it. Great, I enjoyed great putting show, it together. Show, Jack. Beautiful. Thank you, Jack. Enjoy your invitation to scan all my slides. <laughs> Rest so, Eric, Rest Eric, Eric, you have a big. Uh, you, you now have an ever bigger barrier to surmount. <laughs> <laughs> but the record is C E R A. They had 198 on the Manhattan Transfer Show. I'm going to get that show uh, to us, even though it's a Chicago <laughs> presenter. But anyway, neither here nor there. We're we're climbing. So again, Jack, superb. And I'll, let, I'll open it up for everyone else who might want to say something. Thanks, Excellent. Jack. Great show. Great show, Jack. Very, very good. Yeah, great show, Jack. Quite comprehensive. But rest well, your voice. Were we looking a lot at single point switches on some of those um, turnouts? Yeah. yeah. I wonder how many of you think that even those old heritage cars are modern. <laughs> the PCC fall somewhere in the middle. See anything that runs on rail, collects power from overhead current is modern. There you go. But Jack, I used to get trade magazines when I was still working for the TA and Gomaco had an ad in one of them for a heritage type car that was mechanically state of the art, including a standard Wabco Cineston controller with a phony brass controller handle on the top to make it look a hundred years old. Mm -hmm. So Jack, I congratulate Barbara and Jurgen Sense. Uh, for them, it is now 5 a.m. They, mm -hmm. they, 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 <laughs> they got on at 1.30 a.m. and have soldiered through till 5 a.m. And you did have, you had people from Japan all the way to Germany. Oh, very good. Good seeing you, Barbara. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> right. Good morning. Yeah. 
Guten Morgen. I also, I also say, Jack, excellent show. And there's no doubt what's old is now new. And you really showed it very well, gave us terrific insight into, you know, the really how these, these systems uh, interact with the, uh, the economic development of the municipalities that they serve throughout the world. I mean, really, no doubt about it, you're excellent, clear, detailed, incredibly well uh, composed mm -hmm. photographs, yep. second to none. I'm yep. glad you uh, like it. There are so many people uh, who are in the hobby that uh, put down uh, some of the modern streetcar lines and because they're not, the ridership is not as high as light rail lines. But the fact is these lines have caused a lot of redevelopment mm -hmm. and have brought a lot of neighborhoods back, right. especially over the Rhine in Cincinnati. Just right. one really good example of how the, these lines have helped. Mm -hmm. yeah. yes. Speaking of Cincinnati, my, I'm from that area. I have a sister and other relatives that live there who are totally against the Cincinnati streetcar system. And I kept saying what you said, it's going to develop the over the Rhine area. And they said, yes, <coughs> and all those people who live there, those people are going to move up the top of the hill where we live. And we want them to stay down in the, the over the Rhine area. So I thought it was a funny take off on, they recognized that there was going to be right. the that they were going to be relocating people and they didn't like the idea of relocating the people to the top of the hill where they live. Hmm. Well, there's a song, I think, Cole Porter, the folks that live on the hill. But uh, <laughs> actually, when I was in Cincinnati and took those photographs, just about every side on in the over the Rhine section had a truck with building supplies, lumber, uh, electrical equipment on it. And the houses there were really getting to be rebuilt. Now, some say gentrification uh, is not so good because it changes the population in a district, but it certainly uh, makes these houses much more livable when right. all of that work is being done. Yeah. Being from the area, what I'm seeing is, is that the over the Rhine area is returning to the way it was in the 1940s and 50s, before all the Germans that lived there moved to the top of the hill, and now the Germans that moved to the top of the hill, a lot of them are back, moving back down the over the Rhine area. So it's a population shift. Yeah. Yeah, Jack, I wanted to second that it was very nice that you provided all the socioeconomic background. Uh, uh, I don't think that's done enough on the show. So I appreciate the explanation. Barbara and Jürgen, do you have any comments? Great job. Thank you. I hope to see you after this COVID is over. And we're yes. allowed to travel overseas. We are yes. planning to come to US, of course. <laughs> right. Okay, so given the late hour, and I, I see, I think uh, you, this show is was recorded and probably two to three weeks when Sandy, our webmaster gets around to it, it will be posted so you can view it again uh, at your pleasure, but with that, I want to thank everyone for uh, soldiering through. Jack, thank you for a great, great show. And our, totally our, my pleasure. Our biggest turnout ever. Hey, welcome. And to stay and, healthy and, Jack, and safe. And, and Jack, you broke my record. <laughs> By about five next minutes. Year, yeah. Next year, you'll break mine. No, I think Eric. Break Eric. Eric may break yes, both of your records <laughs> next, next month. All right, everyone have a good weekend. Okay, take care, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Go march. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.